thank you everyone who is attending currently um, for joining us on this. And, and I wanna thank all the speakers um, and all of that. I'm just gonna start with a brief introduction of what we're doing here, how we ended up here um, and doing this and, and the people who contributed and whatnot and, and what our vision is on the longer term. Um, but first I'll introduce myself um, and, and perhaps tell you a bit about why I why we're doing this um, or why, why I've come to want to do this for the time. My name is Willow Coyote Maestas. I'm um, here a uh, Hannah Gray Fellow as well as a QBI Fellow at UCSF where I have been really fortunate to um, come into I think a wonderful position. Um, I am mixed race. I'm mixed um, white Chicano and I'm a descendant of Hickory Apache. And for those of you who are mixed, you may have a similar experience where as being mixed, you kind of never really know where you belong, but you can also blend in anywhere. I can white pass, I have that privilege, um, but I also have my feet in many different worlds. Um, and, but I was primarily raised by my white mother. Um, but as a child, I would go and spend time with my native grandmother who would tell, tell me stories about our people's stories and our mythologies about the natural world and our connection to it. Um, and then also I would spend time with my um, grandfather on my mother's side, who is a, um, who is a community college teacher. And, and he would tell stories about the natural world, about ecology and about, the, um, about molecular biology from a young age. So I was raised with kind of these two different sets of stories all the time. And I just voraciously consumed information and then I would just spout it out randomly. I was just a babbling brook of information. Um, and, and so I was very interested in science. And then I ended up in high school and I had a series of teachers who weren't very uh, supportive of me being in science and actively discouraged me to the point where I thought I wasn't gonna continue in school at all. I didn't think I was gonna go to undergrad um, until I found an institution that was very flexible at Evergreen State College. And there I encountered um, wonderful teachers who introduced me to science and told me that I could and were immensely supportive. Um, but in parallel to my own development, while I wasn't raised with them, I met many of my siblings. I have five brothers, um, half brothers, and they were raised in a different environment. And I saw many of them go off to college and then struggle in, 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 in schools because they, they weren't necessarily supported. The, the academic environments were not supportive of um, particularly the STEM environments of native students. And, and I think this is generally true because the systems are built by white people for white people. And so while me as a mixed race person could kind of balance these things a little bit more, um, those who are raised in a different environment and from a different background couldn't. Um, and, and I really think we need spaces for native folk that are safe and supportive within our institutions. Um, and I'm really inspired here by the work of, when I was in grad school at University of Minnesota, I was able to be a part of, um, there's a lot of native grad students at University of Minnesota, and we had a, a director of one of the, uh, the graduate school's diversity office, um, Corey Basimore James, who really created a native um, specific mentoring program or a, a subgroup within the program. And that created this really wonderful community. Um, but it would have been wonderful. And, and she was coming from a sociology background, so it was more geared towards sociology folks. And it would be wonderful if we had something like that, but that was more focused on um, basic biology because the, 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 the so, so that we can't just support each other as native scientists, as native people, but then also as scientists. So we can kind of uh, be within our multiple identities. And in the long term, I think it would be really beautiful to build something like that here at UCSF potentially, because UCSF is specific towards biology. Um, so by definition, everything is going to be built more specifically and could be supportive. Um, and in the last year, we've really seen a sea change in the national discussion around um, creating a more inclusive and open um, uh, and more diverse society, societal organization or we, society has changed the discussion and we've seen in academia and in our areas of science specifically, we've spent, seen a, not, a number of different symposiums started or um, to really highlight diverse scientists or BIPOC scientists. But 
And, and that's been wonderful. I've, I've really loved to see this giant platform that's been given to a lot of people. However, I've seen that for the most part, Native folks have been left out of this because there's very few of us um, and, and we're often invisible. And I think it's important for us to think about how we can do things specifically here. Um, and, and that was really the motivation when um, about when I started in this position as a QBI fellow and the director, Nevin Krogan came to me and, and he's like, you have to on the spot, he told me you have to start an event. And, and so then I got to thinking and, and, um, and a couple of weeks later, I was just feeling a little stressed out because you know, you're like kind of my kind of boss who controls the money is like, you have to do this. Um, so then I came up, um, I, I, I was like, we should do a symposium or an organization where we highlight um, native scientists who are junior all the way up to um, faculty members. And that was kind of the kernel. And so I started talking around to people. I reached out to Judith Simcox, who's one of our speakers and, and has done previous events to highlight Native scientists. Um, and she was really supportive of us. She even helped me come up with a name back in January. Um, and she really helped me start to think about how to craft this event. Um, and with that, you know, I. I think that there's a real need here and, and I'm really hoping that we can like generate or develop this as a platform and perhaps even recruit some grad students and postdocs to UCSF and start to build, build a um, supportive community for native scientists that'll have a concentration um, so that we can start working together um, on these things. And, and, um, and beyond, and, and the reason to do this, of course, at this base is that our institutions, especially our public institutions like UCSF, should really be representative of the communities that sit within demographically. Um, and, but beyond that as well, we, we need new perspectives in science. And so for instance, in biology currently, um, we're, I think, going through this change from studying things in an in vitro reductionist way um, or in model systems all the way to thinking about these as integrated systems, which of course um, UCSF and Quantitative Biology Institute has really been a pioneer in. Um, but we need people who have that naturally in, in, embedded in their selves. And, and of course, native folks are we, we are more connected with the natural world. And, and I think we're ideally suited for thinking about these like systems, biology and integrated in vivo thinking of life. Um, and even beyond that, as native folks, we need to learn how to balance our identities. We need to find spaces where we're not forced to just, you know, as, as the Indian schools used to say, the boarding schools, you know, kill the Indian, but save the man. But we want to be able to save ourselves and, and continue to be ourselves and, and in these spaces. And so I think there's, and, and as native folk, we have a strong storytelling thread in our identity. We, that's what our ancestors did and our grandmothers did for us. And, and we as scientists are so storytellers to the overall science community, but we can be native science storytellers. And, um, and this event I think is doing, is gonna be wonderful to highlight native science storytellers at all stages of the career, um, their career and learning from the wisdom of our elders as well as hearing about our learners and, and younger scientists. So um, with this event, um, the basic idea behind it is that we're gonna have a series of talks. We're gonna have student talks, um, trainee talks, faculty talks, and, um, and the trainees or the learners, um, we're gonna connect them with, with opportunities here at UCSF. So for undergrads, we're gonna connect them to grad programs and graduate students to talk about what their experience has been like and how it is to apply to UCSF. And then for the grad students, we're connecting them to mentors um, that could be their postdoc mentors as well as giving them uh, um, a, a, a session to talk about what it's like to apply to grad school. Um, and then for the faculty, we're really excited to hear um, what they're talking about. And we hope that inspires some of our younger scientists who are speakers. Um, and then we have our elders that we can learn from their experience and, and learn about how we can um, integrate our identity into our research and, and whatnot. Um, and with that, and, and I, I must say that this would not have been possible without um, the organizational support. So QBI has been instrumental in giving us a platform for this and giving us logistical support to host this event um, and giving me a home here at UCSF um, uh, and a community that I'm super grateful for as I've become 
felt very welcome here and supported. And, and I hope other people can too. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, QBI is a um, institute here at UCSF that, um, that uh, organizes many different labs together so we can all work together on studying biology from a quantitative perspective. And, and um, UCSF is really collaborative environment where we all like to work together. And, and that's been one of the things I've loved about being here. Um, and this event occurred due to the hard work of many, many people. As I mentioned, um, Judy and I talked about this at the very, very infancy. And then I reached out to um, a bunch of other graduate students here at UCSF, um, as well as different people, uh, QBI, um, and, and, and other people at UCSF and beyond. And it wouldn't be possible without these folks. And I'm deeply grateful for all of the hard work that was done, um, but also grateful for the patience that everyone gave me as I've developed as a leader, where I came in not feeling super confident and, and not, um, you know, not knowing how to do this. And I've learned a lot because I've never done anything like this before. So I'm very, very grateful for that. I'm also grateful for my cats for giving me emotional support, um, of course, and, and being the most loving fluffs ever. Um, but I also need to really shout out Judy, as I mentioned, for helping us envision things and give us a really strong foundation to work off of um, in frame work. Um, Robbie, for in the last few months, really stepping up and doing an immense amount of work, putting everything together and, um, and, and, and like keeping track of things because I'm terribly disorganized. And on that note, also Gina and the rest of the QBI um, platform team that, that have um, made this so much easier than it would have been otherwise because um, they, they have so much experience and have been so wonderful to work with. And I also want to um, thank Susanna who, who connected a ton of students, two faculty members, and 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 wrangled all the student cats and the faculty cats. And yeah, I'm I'm deeply grateful, and um, I'm happy to say that we're able to provide all the student organizers with um, money for their time, as well as all the speakers. We're, you will all get an honorariums. Our priority was the trainees, but we were able to collect enough money to give everyone honorariums, um, as well as we'll be giving gift boxes. So I, I'm just deeply grateful for everyone. Um, I also want to thank all the sponsors that made this possible and, um, and, and provided funds to enable all of those things. And then finally, tragically, in the last um, week, my grandmother died on Monday, and I've been um, in grieving about this. So it's been really hard, and I'm grateful for everyone supporting me. And I thought she was one of the most generous, wonderful people who I was really close with. Um, and she would be really proud of this because she she didn't care about when I published papers or when I got awards or anything like that. She always cared about when I helped others um, and and helped mentor people. So you know, I'm, I'm deeply grateful. So um, with that, we're going to transition now to a opening ceremony and land acknowledgement that was recorded by um, Canyon Sayers Rood, um, who unfortunately her scheduling didn't match, but um, yeah, thank you. Um, Mishmin Tuhis, Conrakot Canyon, Coyote Woman, Sayers Rood. I come from Indian Canyon Nation, daughter of tribal chairwoman Anne Marie Sayers of the Indian Canyon Mutan Band of Coast and Ohlone peoples. Indian Canyon serves as a safe haven for indigenous peoples in need of land for ceremony and my mother's legacy to open the land as well as keep it available for native community and for settlers and intertribal and international community to come and learn from. To honor the past to shape the future is an integral part of the teachings of my mother and my grandmother. More than no more than 10 years before I was born did the Native American have the right to practice religion freely. And having been brought up in the Bay Area, having been brought up in a very privileged environment where I've always known where my ancestors, ancestors, ancestors have come from. I recognize the blessings and the privilege I have being raised in Indian Canyon, where traditional and intertribal ceremonies have transpired and recognizing and culture sharing has been a fundamental part of my upbringing. 
it's so very important that we honor and acknowledge the indigenous peoples of whose land we are on, no matter where we go. So with that, I want to acknowledge that if we were gathered in person, I invite you to say the word Yalamu. Yalamu is what San Francisco has always been known as. And before English was spoken and before Spanish was spoken, this place was known as Yalamu and is Yalamu because verbiage and language matters. I invite you to say Ramatush. Ramatush is the first language of this territory, of the San Francisco and this Bay Area region. There are eight languages in what we now call contemporary Ohlone territory. I come from the Mutsun dialect in the Southern territories over by Pinnacles Monument. So it's so very important that we acknowledge the original names and languages and spaces and active indigenous communities. So I invite you to learn about the association of Ramatush Ohlone peoples because they are doing so much amazing work in tending and honoring their homelands and raising awareness and educating the public and reminding the community how to be good community members, how to be good guests. Because if we all honor our ancestors and our ancestors' ancestors, we can acknowledge and recognize that they all have indigenous lineages from the land that they come from. However, if you are not on the homeland of your ancestors, 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 then you are a visitor, you are a guest, you are a settler. And in an effort to combat Western settler colonialism, I hope that we don't engage in more colonizer behavior. My mother and my grandmother believe that when song, ceremony, and dancing stops, so does the earth. I too believe that. And I want to offer a grandmother's song to honor our grandmothers, their grandmothers, and in all Mother Earth. For without them and without her, we would not be here. We share this time and space together for a reason. So it's with that humility, that gratitude, that present mindedness that I offer this song here in this space today. And at the end of songs, our community, instead of clapping, we say, oh. So if we were in person, I'd be like, if you can hear me, can I hear you say, oh. And I'd try and be like, yeah, oh. Otherwise, we'll clip out on Zoom. <laughs> and so I invite you to say that at the end of the song. Mrs. Canyon's grandmother's song. The song came to me differently than it was taught. So out of respect of my mentor who taught me a traditional grandmother song, the song came to me and in my dreams, it let me know that it could be recorded. It could be shared in intertribal and intercommunal spaces. And it is a way for us to come together. I identify as a Mutsun Ohlone Chumash California Indigenous Two-Spirit Community member. And I'm going to use my regalia as an instrument because Indigenous peoples, we don't wear costumes. Our regalia or our traditional dress is our medicine. Medicine is not always a pill to get better. It is something that helps make us well. It is something that aids us in our walk, in our life. Medicine is music. Laughter is medicine. Connection to community is medicine. So, this is Canyon's grandmother song. My, my, oh, come on. My, my, oh, come on. My, my, oh, my, my, oh, my, my, oh, my, my, my 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 my
no son in the Mutan language, in breath so it is in spirit. I want to thank you for taking the time to acknowledge Ama Piritakawas. Ama in my language is people and Piritakawas is the land location of all being from. So the people of this land. And we are gathered together. We are gathered in community in this space, in this time as people of this land to talk about ways that we navigate and share information. And I wanna remind you that there are many pedagogies of which we can lean to. Many of us are familiar with the Western settler colonial lens of which when I point out how Western settler science is very dismissive of holistic systems. It likes to learn from, break apart, put together and have controlled environments and studies, which is great. It has helped us advance into the world we are currently navigating. However, there are some troublesome behaviors in that Western settler lens and that mindset because in these societies and in these environments, we have forgotten our sacred obligation. We need to remember that we as humans were given life to tend and steward our homes, the lands that we are on and acknowledge how we benefit and take care of our community. And community is not just human to human. It's recognizing our green relatives. It's recognizing our winged, our finned, our creepy crawly, are four-legged and to honor the life that's lived and the gift that's given. I say this because many times indigenous tech, traditional ecological knowledge gets dismissed by Western science because of the battle between qualitative data and quantitative data. But I wanna point out that indigenous pedagogies have aided indigenous communities in stewarding these homelands since time immemorial. And a lot of the devastation to our ecosystems and to the planet has transpired in the past couple hundred years. That's post-contact. My mother has always said, today is the best day to be alive as a California native person. And as a young one, I didn't fully understand that, but today I do. So I invite you to ground yourself and recognize that we are very lucky and privileged to be where we are. And it's really important that we honor truth and history with where it is that we stand, to acknowledge the histories of these spaces and places that we have settled upon and what we benefit from and how we are in community together. How are we being good ancestors in training? I want to point out this quick little image real quick. This is one of my friends, Amanda Lee Julius. And we need to talk about cultural competency. Some Western academics were so egotistical and proud to point out that no more than 5,000 years ago did the Ohlone people show up in the Bay Area because of the science and the technology they had at the time when they were reporting. We had a cultural sensitivity for culturally competent approaches. The information might have been presented as the information we have now or the technology available to us, we can come to this understanding thus far, because that could totally protect you from future occurrences of when science and in more information becomes available. I want to point that out because that kind of humility, that kind of accountability, and just reciprocity to recognizing that Indigenous peoples are teaching and sharing and pointing out information that is so very important for us to be in community together with that this knowledge and understanding is a way of navigating the world and we should be inclusive and humble and accountable and reciprocal to where this information comes from. So we may have copywritten information, but the indigenous copyright is being humble and accountable to who taught us. So I thank you so very much. I appreciate you for being here. Oh, oh, oh. I want to take a moment to say thank you to Canyon for that amazing opening ceremony and the land acknowledgement. I think it's really important that all of us um, 
take time to reflect on the land that we live on, the people who um, were here before us and the people who continue to cultivate um, this area and not only reflect, but take the time and put in energy into developing meaningful connections and relationships with those people and with supporting them and working with our institutions to support efforts such as giving indigenous land back to indigenous communities. And with that, we're going to go ahead and start with our first student speaker of this symposium, which is Aaron Benjamin Clark from the University of California at Santa Cruz. Hello, everyone. Can uh, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, uh, bougie everyone, and hello. My name is uh, Aaron Clark, and I am here today to talk about the role of PPIs on the growth and redistribution of H. pylori in murine gastric glands. Uh, but first, I'd like to share a little bit about my background. Uh oh. Sorry, I'm having a just, there we go. Okay. So I am a descendant of the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. We call ourselves the Anishinaabe. Uh, my family as seen here has been in the Lake Superior area for a very long time, many hundreds of years at least. Uh, we, <clears throat> uh, I grew up roughly 150 miles Southeast in the city of Duluth, Minnesota, where I grew up and went to school. Uh, I do miss home very much sometimes, but I do look forward to returning there very soon for the holiday break. Um, a little bit about my journey. Uh, my pursuit in higher education would not have been possible without my, uh, oops, sorry. Would not have been possible without my great aunt Ruth pictured in the upper left. Uh, she was a fighter in our community for uh, uh, making indigenous education possible in uh, Minnesota. Uh, following her, uh, following her experience in boarding school, she decided to become politically active, and she lobbied the state legislature to include our people's history in the state curriculum. She also served on the state school board, and she is honored today with uh, as a namesake in many uh, institutions around our our homeland. Uh, as for me, uh, after I left high school, I wasn't really quite sure what I'd like to do in life. So my high school teacher pictured in the upper right suggested that I take classes in community college. And in my time there, I uh, took a one credit class in cell biology and I was just stunned at what could happen in a very small cell uh, that is you know, so small that you can't even see it. And so after that, I reached out to some research labs in the area and I started out at a research project where I was diluting mouse urine, hundreds of samples, and to this day I still get dizzy thinking about the smell. But I moved my, myself up and kept with it, and I started working with phasoactive peptides and hearing, uh, hearing loss. Uh, when I transferred to the University of Minnesota Duluth, I had the opportunity to work with uh, microRNAs and tRNA fragments as biomarkers in ovarian cancer. And following graduation, uh, my mentor at UMD uh, encouraged me to apply to the PrEP program in South Carolina. And so that's a post back program. Uh, and it was there that I really developed my interest in microbiology, studying bacteriophage and Colobacter crescentis. And so now I'm at uh, a, a graduate student at the University of South Carolina. Uh, pictured in the lower right is my lab at a 20-year lab reunion. Uh, and I'm kind of hidden back there in the, in the very back. but. Uh, yeah, I'm, from here, I, uh, I also want to talk about mentorship uh, because I wouldn't be here today without the mentorship of all these people who have provided me with uh, their guidance and wisdom over the years. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, at least acknowledge them here, and I am very appreciative for their support. But uh, now on to my research. Uh, so I study in the uh, Ottoman lab, we study the stomach pathogen Helicobacter pylori. It infects roughly one third of the world's population and is responsible 
for several uh, diseases, including gastroesophageal reflux disease, peptic ulcer disease, and gastric cancer. Uh, when H. pylori occupies the stomach, it migrates to two regions known as the corpus and antrum. The corpus is an, considered an acid secreting region, and the antrum is considered the acid regulating region. And within these regions, there are these small invaginations uh, in the gastric tissue called gastric glands. And it's these gastric glands that uh, we believe that H. pylori is able to hide out in for long period or for long term infections. And uh, when we are considering treating H. pylori, uh, the, uh, a clinician will usually use something called a triple therapy, which is two antibiotics and an acid blocker. Uh, the most common acid blocker is a proton pump inhibitor called omeprazole. Uh, omeprazole works by binding to the gastric ATPase that uh, shuttles uh, hydrogen ions into the stomach lumen, uh, lowering the pH. And it uh, and it will it will lower the pH, and it also seems to have some mild antimicrobial uh, activity. And so, uh, being that my lab studies uh, the survival and uh, of H. pylori in the stomach, I had a very simple question: Why does omeprazole enhance antibiotic treatment? And my hypothesis was that omeprazole enhances H. pylori growth and redistribution within gastric glands. So to tackle this issue, uh, my, my experimental design, uh, or to address this question, I set up my experimental design using a green fluorescent, uh, green fluorescent protein expressing H. pylori that we infect into a mouse model. Uh, and then we will allow the infection to age either 14 or 180 days, representing acute or chronic infections. Uh, and then we will treat the animals with uh, meprazole for five days. Uh, following the, uh, the treatment, uh, we will excise the, the stomach tissue, uh, section it into corpus and antrum. And then using a technique that our lab developed, uh, we are able to uh, isolate the, gland, the gastric glands out of the, these two tissue sections. And our two output, and what we end up getting is uh, these nice little images of where the Blue represents the cells lining the glands or the host cells, and the green represent the H. pylori that we're studying. And so from this, we take two metrics. One is a gland population. And in gland population, what we do is we take the total number of glands that we count, the total number of bacteria that we count, and we, we do a ratio of that. So in this sample, we have six bacteria across four glands. So we would have 1.5 bacteria per gland as an average. The other output we have is gland occupancy. And that would be how many glands actually contain bacteria following, tree, uh, following the infection. And in this case, we have two of four glands that are occupied, and that would be 50% occupancy. And so uh, as some of our data that we've collected, we noticed that PPI treatment changes the gland population and gland occupancy in acute infections. So uh, here on the y-axis, we have the H. pylori per gland, and then we have the two treatments uh, in, in the blue dots, we have the antrum or the acid regulating region. And in the red dots, we have the corpus or the acid secreting region. And so following treatment, what we see is that there is an increase in the average bacteria found within each gland uh, that we, uh, that uh, in the experiment. Uh, when we look at gland occupancy or the percent of glands that are actually occupied, we also see a, a jump in the antrum, but not in the corpus. And this is, very strange because if the omeprazole is supposed to be acting on the acid secreting region, which is the red, red dots here in the corpus, why is it not acting there on gland occupancy and it's acting in the antrum? And so taking this, we went ahead and tried the chronic infection. But with the chronic infection, we decided to add a few more uh, treatment doses. And so in the low, there, we did uh, low and high PPI, which is about five times more and less than the normal PPI. And what we notice with the gland population is that it trends, that it peaks at the low PPI, but trends downward with increasing PPI doses. And with the gland occupancy, we notice that the corpus uh, occupied or occupying H. pylori remained high with all doses, but trended back down with the antrum. 
And, you know, this is a bit of a head scratcher for us. And we, we plan to keep uh, trying to further elucidate this, but this leads me into the two models that I'm going to be exploring in this project. The first model on the left is gland permissiveness. So under normal circumstances, H. pylori can sense acid and it will often uh, move away from it. And that's one of the mechanisms it uses to colonize gastric glands is that it's escaping the acid. And so under the treatment of, of PPI, what we believe could be happening is that the glands become more permissive. But following our chronic data, we wonder if this are, there's also a dose dependency here. And so I call this the gland saturation model, that after the parietal cells, which contain the, uh, the ATPases that acidify the stomach, get saturated with the PPI, that it starts to permeate into the gland. And through the mild mi antimicrobial activity, it's killing off some of the bacteria and causing others to migrate away. Um, and so this is something that we'll be exploring in the future. I have many experiments to under, uh, uh, underway to, to further elucidate this. Uh, but with that, I'd like to say Chi Miigwech, a big thank you to everyone for listening to my talk. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, everyone who helped put on the symposium. I'm very excited to be here today and I'm looking forward to everyone else's talk. I'd also like to thank my lab, uh, the Ottoman lab, especially my advisor, Dr. Karen Ottoman, seen in the orange in the second photo down and Dr. Skander Hathruby, who helped me with the early experiments uh, seen in the light blue. And I'd also like to thank my family seen there at the bottom. And uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions and thank you everybody. Was curious about, so thank you Aaron for the talk. Uh, mm -hmm. Starting off with micro is usually never a bad sign for sure. Mm -hmm. um, in the recruitment of H. pylori to different parts of the gut, are there, are you planning on testing whether or not that H. pylori functions as it normally does without the inhibitor itself? So without PPI treatment versus with PPI treatment, do you get the same phenotype of H. pylori's effect on the gut lumen? Um, so in our lab, we study a lot of uh, chemotaxis. So the way that they navigate through the, the gut is that they respond to many different signals, one of which being acid, um, a lot of other things being uh, things like arginine and fumarase, which are part of the urea cycle. Um, we have done a lot of experiments with gland colonization in the past, and this the, the vehicle control seems to match what we've seen in past models. And the what we see here in, with the PPI treatment is very... It's different, but it's also kind of strange. And so we're, we're gonna further uh, try and piece apart this mechanism. I hope that that answered your question. I will just ask the second part. So I was thinking specifically about the ability to translocate through tight junctions. Are you gonna look at that aspect as well? Oh, yes. So they are actually able to, there have been some studies showing that H. pylori can uh, permeate into the tissue through tight junctions by secreting certain enzymes. Um, I don't know if we're really going to be pursuing that as much. I'm more interested in how it's jumping around the stomach uh, in response to this, this treatment. Um, it, it, so with the gland occupancy, what I'm seeing is that there's a lot more glands being occupied in the stomach. So that kind of tells me that it's, it's moving around. And then uh, when the gland population increases, that's, tell, that's telling me that it's proliferating within the glands. So, yes, thank you for your questions. So I wanted to ask, um, are there lots of bacteria, different kinds of bacteria in the stomach or is H. pylori all, there all by itself? Or I mean, it's sort of a, is there a microbiome of the stomach? There is a little bit of a microbiome in the stomach. Uh, I think it, comparatively to the uh, colon, which has something like 10 to the 14th bacteria per gram of stomach tissue, which is very high. The stomach is more around like 10 to the second or 10 to the third. So there's not quite as many bacteria. There are some species that are uh, adapted to live there, but um, for the longest time, they thought the stomach was sterile and it wasn't really until the eighties that they actually were able to find that uh, H. pylori lives there. I can ask a question, perhaps. Um, sorry, my head isn't clear, so I don't know if it'll totally make sense, but I'll try. Um, so, what, 
Can you speak at all to like mechanisms of coevolution between the two and how that might like if if we're treating you know treating these bacteria as they're like a coevolution arms race that it all happens between you know your your you know treatment with these PPIs and and H pylori. Yeah, so what's mostly studied with H. pylori is the resistance to the antibiotic clarithromycin. And so several years ago, um, the World Health Organization actually released a report listing H. pylori as a high priority for new treatment methods because it's rising uh, resistance rate with H or with a, uh, the clarithromycin antibiotic. In terms of eight, uh, PPIs, I think the biggest concern there is actually um, some of the unintended effects. So there is some uh, nephrotoxicity associated with it. There's also, been, I haven't, I didn't mention it here, but it's one uh, avenue I want to explore is that PPIs actually uh, diminish immune function. Uh, and they do this through a different ATPase. And so um, in terms of evolutionary arms race, I don't, I don't know of too many people actually studying PPIs effect directly on H. pylori other than its mild antimicrobial activity. Um, but thank you for that question. I just want to remind the audience that there is a Q&A feature at the bottom, so you can submit your questions to that um, during the talk or also in the chat, and then we can call on you um, to either read it out loud or if you want, I can read it for you. So Aaron, let me just say, uh, I saw Lynn Bemis in your in your pictures and, and Lynn and Linda B used to come uh, as often as I could get them to New Mexico to talk about things. Can you talk about how, uh, any specifics about how UMD helped you uh, be able to kind of continue in your education? Certainly. Uh, so when I transferred to UMD, um, I, uh, was able to meet up with Dr. Bemis uh, to pursue research projects, and she got me involved in a program that she had started called Native Americans into Medicine. Uh, or no, sorry, Native Americans into Research Careers. And it was through this that I was able to find funding to work in the lab, and I had a chance to go to a SOCNIS conference. And um, she was very supportive of me, uh, you know, pursuing a career in research, and she helped me find the PrEP program uh, and build my, my interest in uh, uh, microbiology and I've kept in touch with her over the years and I you know I do miss her sometimes I wish I had stayed in her lab just because she's such a great mentor so are, are do you see many more people in your tribe getting uh, going to going to college and, and maybe getting higher education I, you know I, I don't see I see some here in New Mexico but I also um, there's some that it's it's just not part of how they're thinking of, of going. Yeah, one, so often what happens is a lot of people want to go to medical school, which is great too. Um, and the medical school in Duluth actually does very well at recruiting Native Americans into uh, medical programs. In terms of scientists, uh, a friend of mine, Casey Dorr, uh, went on to receive his PhD and he's now faculty at the University of Minnesota. Um, yeah, and one thing I didn't mention was that unfortunately on, on our reservation at the moment, we don't have a science teacher to teach the kids. So we really need to, uh, you know, push it into gear and try and get our, uh, you know, good education going for the, for the future and, you know, reinvigorate the, the path that my great aunt Ruth was trying to set for us. Great, thanks for that great um, talk and fruitful conversation. Um, I think it's time for us to move on to our next speaker. I'll just introduce myself. Sio Negada Mer Anderson Daudo, Tito Lagi, Tinela, Ohio. Uh, so hi everyone, Matt Anderson, um, Eastern Cherokee, and I'm here at Ohio State uh, in the The story I want to tell you today is not actually about stuff that's going on specifically here at Ohio State, but it's talking about larger contexts. Um, at the same time, just really quickly, uh, I'll kind of, my landing knowledge around Ohio State has shifted a little bit, 
um, because as things have come to light of around uh, the land grab initiatives, um, Ohio State is definitely implicated in this, um, having accumulated about $6.5 million in wealth based off the acquisition through the Moral Act of lands, uh, mostly West Mississippi, but also including lands specifically here that were occupied um, and the Miami, the Wyandotte, uh, Potawatomi being forcibly removed from this area to make that space. So um, Ohio State has a lot to reckon for. The work I'm gonna talk about today is, is happening specifically on tribal land on Cheyenne River in South Dakota. And so this idea about how do we build research capacity within Indian country that's really being led by indigenous people for and by indigenous people, right? And so this all started with conversations going on as part of a program called SING, which stands for the Summer Internship for Indigenous People in Genomics. And I think a bit of this work can be traced specifically to the 2018 conference, which is uh, shown here, which occurred up in Seattle. And I want to let a couple of people that are part of SING that really kick-started these conversations. Um, these would be Joe Rochetta, Crystal Sosi, and Caleb Fox, who's here with us today and is great. Um, and the fourth person here is uh, Guthrie Ducheneau, who I'll introduce a little bit later. But it was in conversations, especially among these groups within SING, or these folks within SING, that we started asking, where is this program which trains people and under indigenous people specifically in understanding genetics, genomics, the implications of doing that work, so that they can be advocates with their own communities for questions around these issues and when approached by researchers, to addressing other aspects that we don't get a chance to do in this just week long workshop. So the workshop has been great in being able to do some things. Um, it's been around for about 10 years now, trained about 120 participants from 60 different nations, communities. We've been able to put forward some really uh, high impact guidelines on how to engage indigenous people in research. Uh, this one was published here in Science in 2018 and then Nature Communications uh, in 2018 as well. And so you see a lot of um, people that were involved in these projects that are just amazing uh, scientists and investigators in their own right, Katrina Claude, the University of Colorado, Nana Garrison, UCLA, Kayla is everywhere, and then uh, Renee Begay here at the University of Colorado. And this has been great. So Singh has been able to do some really good stuff. Uh, it's been able to expand. So it started in the US, but now there are Singh programs running in Canada, in Atroa, New Zealand, um, in Australia, there's one slotted to begin in seeing Mex uh, Mexico specifically this coming summer in 2022. But the requirement for this work, things like seeing really falls from misconduct. And the misconduct has been facilitated by the fact that tribal people haven't been able to dictate exactly how that research happens. And so kind of a classic example of this is the how Supa case um, that kind of came to a head uh, around 2002, 2003, that samples from the Havasupai who had solicited uh, researchers from ASU to help them understand why diabetes was so prevalent in the community were being used for a bunch of studies that had nothing to do with diabetes. And so the Havasupai sued the Arizona Board of Regents for uh, research misconduct and were eventually able to get their samples returned to them in 2010 when they settled out of court. So we don't know the exact details, but this is emblematic of kind of a larger issue here, which is the fact that if you look across the last 20 plus years, there's been a number of different projects that have been seeking to take materials from indigenous people and use it for their own purposes. And we see this really clearly laid out within DNA projects specifically. So this goes back as far as 1993, with the human, human Genome Diversity Project, which ended up getting labeled specifically a vampire project because people within this project were going into indigenous communities across the globe, taking blood, and then that's it. They'd never hear from them again. As time went on, other projects began to kick off um, that should have recognized the problems with the Human Genome Diversity Project but didn't. And this is things like the Genograph Project, which started in 2005, and a number of newer projects. Um, the Helix Project, which is fundamentally the Human Genome Diversity Project 2.0, the Million Veterans Project, which occurs here specifically in the United States, which is collecting genetic material from veterans, 
And as many of you probably know, the military community is overrepresented with uh, Native Americans and Alaska Natives. And then the All of Us project, which has been pushed forward through uh, NIH. And so there are lots of different projects that are seeking indigenous DNA within these areas. And that becomes problematic for a lot of reasons. But there's an incredible amount of material that's already out there. If you look at kind of direct to consumer genetic testing that's been done, we've seen a 50 fold increase in the number of available genomes over just six years. One in five US citizens have done a direct uh, to consumer genetic test, and that information is now being stored with the testing company itself. And on average, about one um, in 200 people, one person contributes to about 200 different genetic studies when they provide that material. And so there could be these ideas that, well, it's just some DNA. And, and I would argue that that's, that really uh, misses some of the aspects about how this is being used to facilitate power. And that really comes around the uh, monetary value that this information holds. If you look at the direct-to-consumer genetic testing market, you can see that there's a shift from being a net value of about 1 billion a couple of years ago to a predicted net value of 3.4 billion in 2028, based on kind of the growth characteristics that have occurred. This is expected to have a 12% uh, compound annual growth rate per year. And the market's expanding into places where it hasn't traditionally been quite as available. So you're seeing a lot of expansion specifically within certain uh, markets in South and Southeast Asia, as well as markets opening up in um, Northern and Southern Africa and the Middle East. And when companies that provide direct to consumer genetic testing get this information, it holds real power. And you can see that with the transactions that have occurred specifically around this information. And the most notable is the uh, acquisition of Ancestry DNA by the Blackstone Corporation, which is a pharmaceutical conglomerate for the tune of $4.7 billion just in the last year and a half. So there's a lot of abilities to influence different areas of kind of day-to-day -day life, uh, health outcomes for different people around this information. And so um, and borrowing an analogy from Crystal Soci that I, I absolutely love, you know, these companies are both targeting and using non-targeted kind of batch collection of this information to get information about indigenous DNA from different global communities. And then the idea is to shift it to profit, right? And that transition really asks, well, who's benefiting from this movement of material that people are collecting without providing any real uh, recompense or benefit in return, and then making more money to be able to do things that those individuals within those corporations uh, dictate as opposed to the people that provided the samples in the first place. And this is, you know, brought up a rising chorus of concerns around the way that this works um, from a number of different sources in popular press. And one that I, I do want to kind of point out specifically is the letter from NCAAI, the National Congress of American Indians, to the All of Us program that was delivered about two years ago, fundamentally giving them a cease and desist order um, because they were attempting to access DNA samples from tribal members that were off the reservation where tribal governments had less ability to, to implement that governance and uh, autonomy that they have. And this is really just kind of a continuation of, of old methods of extraction um, where different forms of capital now being, instead of land and material resources, exists around information and data that's obtained from that information. Specifically, we were coming at it from the, pro, from the uh, point of view of being genetic information. So if this is true, how could the process be altered? And the process doesn't happen just from corporations. The process also happens from different academic institutions that many of us are affiliated with, right? And so a lot of researchers will come in with an interest in working with the tribal community on a certain uh, project. And the assumption is by the researcher that this would be fairly straightforward, that they go into tribal IRB, then the IRB will approve it, and they'll be able to go out and find the participants um, to be able to begin participating in the study. 
But the reality, uh, as many of you know, is that it's not nearly that straightforward. Right. They end up going to a tribal committee, maybe an RRB, or maybe it's an IHS RRB, but those two are going to talk to each other anyway. And then the IHS is going to end up reaching out to the university and begin talking to both that and the federal granting agency. And then the university, the federal granting agency, will get back to the researcher, right? And it makes it really difficult. And so this pushes an impetus for not working in ways that are as direct and looking for things like broad consent to be able to pull as much information from every study as possible so that you don't have to go through this process over and over. But broad consent can have its own concerns and uh, qualms with about that approach as well because it allows probably the possibility of using information for purposes it wasn't originally designed for or at least the intentions weren't originally there for. And so this creates a lot of disillusionment. And there become hindrances to engagement with Native communities on the part of researchers. They don't understand how to engage in these tribal communities. They don't understand the IRB structures and some of these IHS and federal government involved uh, actors that are involved. The investment in time and resources becomes a deterrent. They have to deal with a relatively small number of participants within certain communities. Also issues around revealing identity because of those small numbers. And they're going to be thinking about previously unsuccessful attempts for engaging tribal communities that they're going to hear more broadly within the scientific community or maybe from people that they collaborate with as well. And I think it's important to note that this is a two-way street, right? Yes, there are hindrances from the researchers, but there's tribal participants that absolutely um, also see this as problematic because where's the benefit, right? There are issues around redefining political status as well as uh, defining blood quantum, not based on rules that have been set up by tribal governments, but based on these aspects of DNA. And we saw this play out in the elections from four years ago, uh, replacing cultural identity with binary identifiers, things of returning the results at all, being associated with these studies, depending on what the study's involved in, taboos around blood draws, et cetera, right? So there's a number of things that all prevent uh, that participation because of fundamental things around biocolonialism and who controls and the results of, of these interactions. And I want to say that this doesn't just apply to material sources, that really does apply to data, because we look at a standard study involving tribal participants, tribal participants interact with the researcher that obtains whatever materials that are required, including, you know, just survey data. Researchers are typically required through their grants to then deposit that information into government or academic databases that are controlled by government or academic sources. So as you move, as the information moves away from tribal participants, there's a very quick loss of ownership in that information and where it gets disseminated back out to because of this relationship between the researchers and the government and the academic institutions, where the government puts in these databases so it can be accessed back by the researchers, right? And that's particularly problematic here because tribal participants are not just participants, they're representatives of that tribal government. So they're covered under things around governance, sovereignty, and treaty rights, and they're not individuals acting of their own accord. They're acting as a collective group in a nation. So I think some of these issues um, are highlighted well in a quote by Kim Talbert, um, who's an amazing uh, researcher and academic all around. And so I've kind of, there's a lot to this, but I kind of highlighted some of the key uh, phrases here in red, these ideas about meaning, so who gets to tell the story and ensuring that indigenous voices have a clear stake in the way that this operates. So kind of push back against the two main models that exist for doing research. One is tribally driven research and one is a tribal trust relationship with academic or federal institutions or maybe industry partners that are gonna be running the research agenda itself. And so, I've kind of listed out here some of the qualities that differentiate or distinguish these two approaches, right? And there are deficits to both of these. In tribal trust relationships, there's no ownership by participants or tribal nations that participate. You don't know if you're gonna get results back. Um, and the consequences of misconduct, as we've seen in the past, are usually a slap on the wrist at most. This contrasts a little bit with tribally given reasons, which does allow ownership, which is great, there are going to be definite consequences as a result of mismanagement or misconduct. 
but there are other hindrances that make this more challenging. It's hard to find staff to be able to conduct these resources that exist within your own tribal community. There's issues about obtaining the funding to be able to do some of this work because of those questions that funding agencies are going to have around people that are trained to be able to do that work itself. And so if tribes don't necessarily have the capacity to be able to perform the work and academic institutions or federal institutions aren't seen as best actors in these processes, is there another way? And that's, that's really where I want to speak to right now. And we think that the answer is yes, that there is another way, which is done through an indigenous third party actor that works and in partnership with tribal entities. And so what this would do as a native third party uh, owned operation is it would ensure that tribal oversight and the consequences still exist for those within that entity that may play as bad actors down the road but at the same time, because it's an indigenous led organization, the data would be retained in tribal trust. So it wouldn't leave tribal hands. And the tribal would have, I will say, over that information, including the. Matt, um, we can give him a minute and have him reconnect. Welcome back, Matt. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the caveat of doing this from your basement, I suppose. Um, is there right if I pick up again? Yeah, of course. Um, All right. Just go ahead and share your screen. And we have lunch in at 11, but we'll see how we're doing just in terms of questions. And if we go over a few minutes, it's fine. Okay, I will do my best not to go over time. All right. So hopefully I left off here. Um, you, you were one slide prior. Oh, crap. All right. So the idea here is that we could build a entity, a nonprofit organization that really meets kind of the, the pieces that spur the ability to do research as well as the oversight uh, to build something new and a little bit different. And with that, uh, we were able to birth the first indigenous-led uh, biobank, which is called the Native Biodata Consortium. So this is a nonprofit research center located on Cheyenne River Reservation that's capable of doing all BSL-2 plus work, um, that has the equipment to run molecular assays and has the informatics infrastructure to store and signal data on uh, some well-constructed server networks. Because it's located on Cheyenne River, it's overseen by that tribal government, ensuring that we're doing what we're supposed to and the samples are always maintained on tribal lands. It's advised by community members, both the community advisory group from Cheyenne River, as well as some other Lakota reservations in the area, including Rosebud. It uh, retains local indigenous legal advisors through a company called Big Fire, which is located on Cheyenne River, and its executive board is entirely indigenous. And so what we see MBDC doing is being able to fulfill kind of those aspects of both tribal governance as well as academic research capacity by building in both the ability to perform the science, maintaining data sovereignty specifically within tribal nations, and then engaging the community, both local and those that we are partnering with across the United States in the ethics and the regulations set up around storing and maintenance of specimens as well as data so that the decisions about what happens with those things always exist within the tribal community's hands. MBC is currently working on a number of different activities to really build out and empower different tribal nations and communities, uh, not only on Shine River, but in other areas, including both data ethics and classroom type training sources, which I'll talk a little bit more about as well, um, pushing on indigenous data sovereignty and, and ideas and concepts around ID stuff, and then uh, work, the science itself and the data management and data analysis itself. And so I'll walk through a couple of examples about how MBDC is working in these areas to really push out that governance and, and tribal oversight. And the first is around COVID-19, which makes a lot of sense considering the last two years. And as some of you may have seen, Cheyenne River was in a really interesting position last April, last March, where it actually closed its borders to freeway traffic, not allowing people transiting, uh, including semis, 
through its lens to be able to pass, but everybody had to go through checkpoints. And so COVID-19 is something that Cheyenne River has been thinking about a lot. And so there are different initiatives that NBC has started in partnership with the Cheyenne River uh, Sioux Tribe to focus on COVID-19 testing. MBDC is currently uh, working through the process of CLIA certification around this to begin doing environmental management of different pathogens that exist within uh, water treatment facilities and local waterways, and then helping work on education and informing policy in the area. I wanna to touch on this a little bit more just because of my background in microbiology and note that infectious disease is fundamentally a native issue. If you look at this table, which kind of outlines the relative risk ratios for different infectious organisms in American Indians and Alaska Natives compared to their white counterparts, what you're gonna see is there's an increased risk, almost independent of who you are and where you live for native people and indigenous people in North America. And so in another way that MBDC is working on building that research capacity is through this other study called SAIL, which is a study of autoimmunity in Lower Dakota. This is an initiative led by Mike Snyder's lab at Stanford to understand why rheumatoid arthritis on Cheyenne River is so prevalent. And it's looking at a number of aspects, uh, Mike Snyder being a very omics focused person, proteomics, transcriptomics, genomics of participants, environmental sampling, um, and some aspects that we're involved in specifically around microbiome and rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis is two times uh, as likely to be found in individuals in South Dakota than the U.S. general population. And if you look specifically on Cheyenne River, the incidence of rheumatoid arthritis is actually five times higher. And so this could be due to a number of components, but I think that higher incidence in South Dakota suggests that there are environmental pieces to this that could be due to environmental exposures as well as different microbes that exist in the area or within uh, that folks encounter there more likely. And this, this role for the microbiome, I think is further supported by the fact that when somebody is diagnosed with RA, there's a change in the gut microbiome about six months prior to that diagnosis. So the diagnosis can really be predicated based on the microbiome change, suggesting that there's a strong component. And we're actively investigating that link now between the microbiome and rheumatoid arthritis. We also have different training opportunities that MBC has led. One of those in data that we just formed this, this year, focusing really on training folks in aspects of informatic analysis and biological systems, as well as moving into other scientific systems like geology and uh, forestry. And this is being performed on site at MBDC. And the, the reason that we think MBDC could play a, a particular really important role within this is because of the proximity of MBDC to a number of different TCUs in the area, some of which already have biology degrees or have genetics courses that exist. We can help bolster and create programming around to increase the curriculum so that different Native folks in the TCU system have more exposure to the sciences and the biomedical sciences as well. So with that, um, just to close really quickly, thank all the folks at MBDC that have been part of the board and really building this out, uh, partners at Stanford on some of the projects that I mentioned, the Singh leadership who's listed over here on the right, number of folks that uh, I've mentioned as well here, and two people I want to highlight within my own group that are kind of front and center in this work between MBDC and rheumatoid arthritis is uh, Crouch, which is, who is shown here in the middle of our group, and then uh, Molly Rambo, who's a Cheyenne River tribal member here at Ohio State, who's been helping conduct some of this work as well. And so with that, take any questions you may have. Thanks, Matt. Um, we have a question from Mary. It, the question is, in terms of data ownership, there are certainly parallels to traditional copyright law, the topic that the UN is addressing now. How can we, or have we already, brought this issue forward using the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People? Yeah, so there's a lot of movement been on DRIP right now around how information, and especially genetic information, is going to be used or stored. And so some of this revolves around the Nagoya Protocols and whatnot, but there's pieces of genetic information or, or human even environmental information that are missing from those contexts. And this is being brought to the forefront now with the number of different initiatives to catalog uh, diversity of all life across the planet. I think you're gonna see those conversations come up more. I think the best 
example of where those conversations have moved farther ahead than they have here in the US is going to be with Maori uh, pushback on the way that New Zealand currently manages those sources. Um, I think I already said right now. So I think really what the Maori are doing in pushing their federal government to acknowledge the importance and the connections that these not only human information, but non-human information have to their communities is going to be uh, where you're going to see things move in the UN. But it has not happened yet. Those conversations are definitely starting to kick off, though. Matt, I'd like to ask a question about diagnostics. So I work, I have a lot of cancer in my family, and we also, I help um, uh, fa adopt a family from um, some tribes. And, and so the problem is that, uh, are you guys working with any sort of uh, 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 genetic panels for uh, looking for cancer genes? Because, you know, the last time I had to do this, I had to make sure that they weren't like 15 things that they weren't doing, that the, the sample, you know, everything would be thrown away, that nothing would be researched. And so anyway, I just wondered if you what the connections are with the, with diagnostics. From the rheumatoid arthritis work, the Snyder Lab is currently pursuing a patent on a protein array for early diagnosis. The IP around that protein array is gonna be shifted back to the tribe. So the Cheyenne River Sioux tribe is gonna own the patent and any, uh, and therefore get a large sum of the money that comes from the production of that technology. The Snyder Lab is going to have a small portion of those funds come back to them. And I think MBDC is going to have a small portion of those funds come back to them. So we're currently working through how to set up the IP around that patent and that technology to ensure that money is being returned in a way that makes sense. And this becomes harder, especially when dealing with an institution that initiates the patent itself, right? So we're working on that now, it's in progress. There are certain issues that have arisen because of that relationship, which we're have, gonna have to figure out how to deal with because if that's where we're trying to go, it's gonna, we're gonna have to have a roadmap. So it's easier for academic institutions to know how to do this in a way that's right. It just seems like, like there's an Vitae and there, I mean, there's all these different companies now that are doing, doing panels for, you know, uh, Omniprint and Metaprint and I don't know, whatever else, you know, all the things to sort of predict uh, how rapidly growing the cancer is and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just, uh, you know, it's something I, I would hope that you get the time to kind of think about that, but that's really not academic. That's, that's company stuff. It's big, big pharma and, you know, growing companies and very difficult to, it seems like to me in my experience to get them to um, see this as something that's really important. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what's gonna continue falling out of the TGen partnership at City of Hope. I think it's gonna be interesting to watch as they begin producing technology from their relationship with tribes in the Southwest to see if it's managed correctly, because I know City of Hope is really trying to hold TGen's feet to the fire, but TGen now owns City of Hope. So how that relationship is gonna work out is gonna be complicated. Um, there's one more question from the chat. I think that was a really important question and discussion. And, and I just want, I'm going to say this question over here, but first I just want to say thank you, Matt, for that. Um, I would love to talk to you at another time just about these things and, and think about how I can incorporate them in what I'm doing. Um, but Steve Finkbeiner asks, our group does a bit of human genetics and these are complex, difficult problems. One challenge is that discoveries sometimes can only be made if the data set is sufficiently large. If the data reside at one location, do you have systems that would make it possible to do joint analyses with other outside data sets? Yeah, it's a really good question. This is an area that Crystal Soci specifically has been spending a lot of time thinking about, which is the how do you build a dynamics and consent portal? So once the data is housed at an entity like NBDC that works as an intermediary between tribal governments and researchers, 
how do you build any infrastructure to allow access to that data to be able to be combined with other data sets? You can do these large scale uh, or meta analyses. Um, regulation is going to be key. And that's where this dynamic consent portal comes in. Instead of seeking broad consent, can you go back out to individuals that provided information or materials um, to a prior study and get them to be able to make a decision about whether or not they're interested in having their information used in subsequent trials and do that each study one at a time. I think that's going to be the, the best way to approach this because it does allow research to happen, but it's research that happens based around like the decisions of the participants, not around the decision of the researcher. And so it gives control to the people that undergird any of the studies. And that's the way we're at least thinking about it right now. All right, thanks for that, Matt. Um, I think we're moving, we're into the lunchtime break. So I want to, to respect everyone's time to take a breather and then we'll be back at, um, I think in one hour. And um, yeah, thanks to all the morning speakers and everything. It's, um, you're all very inspiring and it's, I, I love hearing the, how we're bridging our identities and our stories and how it's all coming together. So yeah, thank you. I hope you enjoy your break and I look forward to seeing everyone afterwards. Feel free to start, Angel, whenever you like. Um, you'll kick off our afternoon session and we'll have a nice fun, with more exciting research talks. Okay. <clears throat> ah, come on. Oh, sorry. Oh, and before we begin, sorry, oh, to interrupt. Oh. Um, I would like to remind everyone to use the Q and A uh, function to, to for any uh, questions that you may have during the talks. But yeah, now you can take it away, Angel. Okay. Um. Yad a she a Angel a si ni she tori chi ni ni she a bashi shin totsu ne deshi che the best legend a dashinale. Um. Hello. My name is Angel Leslie. I am Bitterwater, born for Water's Edge. My maternal grandfather is Big Water, and my paternal grandfather is Black Sheep. So that is how I identify myself as a Navajo lady. Um, I am a senior at college, currently studying biology and biomedical sciences. And I am a part of the um, undergraduate writing for burgeoning research of American Indian neuroscientists or your brain um, at Diné College. And through that program, I got to um, work at the Center for Innovation of Brain Science um, at, U at, at the University of Arizona. And so this is my talk on, uh, on the research that I helped with over the summer. So my mentor is um, David Bradford. He's a second year PhD student at the University of Arizona. And the PI I helped work with was Dr. Kathleen Rogers. I'm trying to get it to go. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so just a little bit of background. Um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, um, is a neurodegenerative disease that leads to the loss of neurons and ultimately leads to complete paralysis and death. Um, one famous man that had it is uh, Stephen Hawking, but <laughs> he had a very rare kind of ALS because he lived for so long. Um, the average life expectancy is between two to four years after diagnosis. Um, so approximately 90% of ALS cases are sporadic. So they just happen for no reason. While the remaining 10% have a genetic etiology and the four most common genes that are associated with ALS are SOD1, C9ORF72, FUS, and TDP43. ALS disproportionately affects men more than women. Currently, there is no cure for ALS, but there are some um, FDA-approved medications, uh, Rilusal and Edorovone. Uh, it's kind of a, a funny word. Um, so the current available treatments have limited efficacy um, and only extend life a few months at best. 
So uh, with limited treatment options for patients with ALS, there's a desperate need to develop new therapeutics with a greater efficacy and uh, oh, than those on the market. Okay. So specifically, I'm going to be talking about the SOD1 gene. So SOD1 stands for superoxide dimutase 1. It's a member of the superoxide dimutases. Um, it is an antioxidant enzyme that is composed of two polypeptide genes and is localized within the cytoplasm. So normally the SOD1 enzyme attaches to copper and zinc throughout the body to break down superoxide free radicals. And these free radicals are charged oxygen molecules that can be toxic and damage cells. Um, but there, there are over 150 mutations of SOD1 that are associated with familial ALS. So we move on to the mechanisms of A1 through 7. So mass and AT1 receptors are expressed are expressed on neurons, astrocytes, and microglia. So I don't know if I can use like a pointer, but if you look at the, uh, I love this image, it's on the left-hand side because you see the AT1 um, <clears throat> throws up there and then you see the mass. So and of the <clears throat> overactivation of the AT1 receptor increases neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, and may become cytotoxic, while the mass re receptor kind of um, does the opposite. It reduces inflammation and balances the renin angiotensin system. And um, so A1 through 7 is kind of what um, activates the mass receptor and keeps the balance um, in the brain. So in the brain, A1 through 7 increases nitric oxide release, increases ENOS and NOS activity, decreases oxidative stress, and um, production of A1 through 7 varies among individuals. <clears throat> so moving on, so we're going to be talking about RASRx throughout the rest of the presentation. <clears throat> so RASRx1902 is the is a small molecule mass receptor agonist. So uh, it kind of mimics the A1 through 7. It activates the mass receptor so that it will continue to balance the renin and geotensin system. So um, as stated before, ALS patients have limited treatment and limited therapeutic benefit when given the treatments. So the goal of this study is to measure the safety and e efficacy of the um, MassRx1902 in preclinical models. And so the overall end goal is to create a new drug for the treatment of ALS and get MassRx1902 for patient to use. So here's kind of the study breakdown. I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly. <laughs> so study one was just finding the dosage. So we got two mg per kick. Study two, um, you observe mechanistic changes. So that's kind of looking at immunohistochemistry protocols and staining of the neuromuscular junction and spinal cord. And study three was measured the extension of life. So kind of the behavioral analysis of the study. So immunohistochemistry is my favorite thing. Um, so basically you're staining the spinal cord and your junctions and you're getting these beautiful fluorescent um, images. So as you can see on the left-hand side is the wild type microglia. Um, it's kind of spread out, it's more defined, whereas on the disease side, it's kind of more chunkier and, and kind of like blurry. And then moving on to the astrocytes, uh, you see that the astrocytes are, you kind of don't want as many astrocytes because it's an um, immune response. So the more you have, kind of like the more damage you have. And then this is a picture overall. I tried to get the glare out of it, but it was kind of hard because I was taking a picture of it. But this is one of the stains that I did. And this picture does not do it justice. As pretty as, pretty as it is, it just, it's not, it's prettier in person. So study three, behavioral changes. Um, so what we did was, if you look at the top left uh, picture, you see that the mice's leg or the mouse's leg are closer together, which means that um, it's uh, the disease progression isn't as bad. But when they stop doing that and their legs are spread out, that means that's the first symptoms of showing ALS. So to measure 
their behavioral changes, we did what is called the uh, rotor rod test where they run like on a rod for a certain amount of time. And then the hang wire test where they just hang on to like a wire and you measure their grip strength. So moving on to the results. Um, so change in body weight. Body weight kind of measures the healthiness of the mice. So as you can see, um, the change in body weight it became significant between the control and 1902 groups. Uh, the 1902 groups retain more weight than the um, control that had the ALS uh, gene. And then the symptomatic onset, like we measured the average age um, when symptomatic onset began and then just the overall life. So if you look at the first graph, you kind of see there's no difference between them, but comparing it to the overall extension of their lives beginning from day one to the end, to the end study endpoint is, is pretty significant. And results continued. And so now we just compared the survival curves between the males, the females, and the overall curves. So if you look, there's really no um, difference <laughs> in the males, but in females, there is a significant difference. And moving on, <laughs> so study conclusions. Um, so far, the daily treatment of BASRX-1902 has been shown not only to delay symptoms, but also extend life after symptoms begin. Um, we also show that through early anal analysis of microglia in the 1902 treatment group, that um, between the microglia, you can see the um, how they're shaped differently, kind of comparing them like from being elongated to being more chunkier and blurrier. And so, so yeah. And then <laughs> moving on, we would have to um, do more analysis on the same spinal cord samples, uh, neuromuscular junction, and finalizing a behavioral test to complete the characterization of disease progression in the 1902 treatment. Sorry if I did that really fast. I, <laughs> I didn't want to take up too much time, but um, yeah, so I did this at the University of Arizona, and then these are my references. Yeah. Awesome, great talk. Thank you, Angel. Sorry. Um, yeah, my alarm went off. Okay. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the question and answer box. Um, I guess I have one quick one for right to begin with. Uh, what do you think could possibly explain that sex difference that you're seeing in your female data? Do you have any ideas? Or um, let me focus. Um, I've got this question a lot, and honestly, I just I'm not too sure. Um, I know that in some studies there has been shown that. Um, estrogen kind of plays in the factor of some neurodegenerative diseases, but, um, but I'm not too sure about ALS, so. Thank you for your answer. That's definitely very interesting, a very cool study. I, I have a question. Also, I wanted to say a comment. You're really bold to give your talk. I, I, you know, as an undergrad, I just want to highlight that you're an undergrad. And that's amazing. All the work that you've done in your research and, you know, um, and, and you gave a wonderful talk. Um, my question is, it looked like ACE2 is involved in that. And to my knowledge, ACE2 is involved in COVID as well, I think. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Um, Sorry, I got excited. Uh, no, no, and so I'm just curious, like about any potential interactions between ALS and COVID, or like whether there's anything there. Yeah, that's actually very interesting because I remember um, when I first started my internship, um, my PI, Dr. Rogers, told us specifically that ACE2 was um, involved in COVID progression within the body. So it's kind of, I'm not too sure <laughs> between the link between COVID and ALS, but, um, but yeah, it's funny that you made that comparison because I remember that. <laughs> Very cool. All right, thank you, Angel. Um, we'll need to be moving on to our next speaker who will be uh, Sarah. If you could please. Hi, yeah. Yep, there you are. Share my screen. Are people seeing the presenter view or the regular view? We see the regular view, so feel oh. free to take it away. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sira. Uh, my research focuses on the development and regulation of rhythmic behavior. 
um, under the mentorship of Dr. Ji Hong Bai. Before I get into my science, I wanna um, think and think about where I've come from, where my family comes from and how they uh, carry me through my science. And so here's just some pictures of, some of my family. Um, I'm Dakota Lakota. I'm a member of the Crow Creek Sioux tribe shown here. Um, this is my grandma and some of my other grandmas and grandpas and my mom. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my relatives and uh, my family are, uh, they ground me in my, in my journey through science and they've always supported me in what I'm doing. And so with that, I can start or tell you all about my academic career. Uh, I grew up in Arizona and played soccer my whole life. And that allowed me to attend Johns Hopkins and play soccer there and get uh, my uh, BS in neuroscience. I stayed in Baltimore uh, as part of the prep program that some people have talked about and studied in a lab in doc under Dr. Charlotte Sumner looking at spinal muscular atrophy. Um, I then applied to graduate school and decided to come to Seattle, which is where I am, <clears throat> in the molecular and cellular biology program here at the University of Washington. I work here at the Fred Hutch. Um, I live on the uh, traditional lands of the Duwamish and Coast Salish people. And so with that, um, I'll get into my science. Um, so rhythmic locomotion is all around us. It, um, we perform this behavior every day um, and it it's what keeps us going. So on this slide are three examples about how um, we perform rhythmic behavior, swimming, biking, and running. Um, what all these have in common is that uh, they happen, they allow us to navigate our environment, but they also happen with a repetitive manner and a set frequency over a period of time. Um, so rhythmic locomotion isn't just important for our, our human relatives, but it's also important for our animal kin. And so um, on the next slide is an example of that. Um, so um, in this video, you're seeing a classical example of rhythmic locomotion uh, by this eagle here, um, which is flying. And so this eagle is a lot, arranges its wings by flapping them up and down and <clears throat> allows the eagle to search for food and watch over us. Um, and so this is to show that all animals, invertebrates and vertebrates alike, perform rhythmic locomotion in order to survive, whether that's chasing after prey, um, or getting food or um, running away from predators or, or escaping from predators. Um, so these uh, behaviors are essential for survival and there are no neural mechanisms that are important uh, to generating this behavior. <clears throat> so we have a general understanding of what those neural mechanisms are and I'm gonna go into that in the next few slides. Um, it's thought that the simple reflex model which has been extensively studied um, is important as well as the central pattern generator model. Um, and so the simple reflex model, um, here's a basic schematic of that. Um, in this, a motor neuron is able to send a signal to the muscle telling it to contract. Um, this information is then, then sent back to the uh, original neuron through uh, the sensory feedback loop here. And so this model is um, heavily relies on this feedback in this loop. And so it was originally thought that rhythmic locomotion um, happened on based off these continuous feedback loops. Um, however, a study in the 60s pointed to um, <clears throat> these groups of neurons, which are called central pattern generators, or I'll call CPGs from now on, are actually the players that are important for generating rhythm. So what's different with the CPG model is that these CPGs or groups of neurons are able to intrinsically produce rhythm um, on their own. They don't require any sort of information um, from <clears throat> ex extrinsically. However, um, these CPGs can send that rhythm to the muscle telling it to contract. What's different here is we don't know the role that sensory feedback plays on um, shaping this behavior. We know that these CPG, what is unique to CPGs is that they require no extrinsic sensory information to generate rhythm. However, it's thought that sensory feedback um, and sensory neurons are important for shaping CPG output. So in my project, I'm interested um, in understanding how these neural circuits work and uh, to produce smooth and reliable rhythmic behavior. Um, 
it's quite complicated because there's a lot of neurons and players involved among CPGs and we don't know what they are, or how they're regulated. And further, we don't know how um, feedback loops are integrated into this system um, to shape, you know, if someone were to be running and had to abruptly stop or like move, um, how feedback loops come into play to shape this behavior. <clears throat> and so I'm looking at this question from a developmental lens. Um, and so my overarching question is to understand how rhythmic behavior is enabled and uh, the contribution that developmental programs have to these rhythmic and locomotor circuits. Um, so this basic picture just illustrates that a lot of changes happens, you know, from being a baby up into adulthood. Um, and we know that there are a lot of there are developmental programs um, that make these changes that allow us to grow and produce robust rhythmic locomotion. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to look and use a model with a real, unlike uh, humans and eagles, I wanted to use a model that had a relatively simple nervous system and the C. elegans um, nematode um, has a simple nervous system. And so on this slide, uh, you're seeing a worm, an adult wild type worm swimming and performing rhythmic behavior. And so this animal is able to swim by propagating its head forward and making these dorsal and ventral um, bends that's propagated along its body. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm using this model to understand my question. And this is really the foundation of my studies in grad school. However, I also wanted to bring in that developmental lens. And so shown here, the <laughs> The large discrepancies of an L1 animal up into adulthood. And we can see that the animal undergoes drastic changes um, to get to this stage uh, with their tissues. But we also know that this animal, a lot of changes happen at the nervous system level. So the C. elegans nervous system matures quite a bit um, from birth up until adulthood. Um, an adult animal has about 302 neurons or has 302 neurons and about 8,000 synapses. However, um, they have much less when they're born. And so a lot of uh, rewiring and remodeling is going on throughout development. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to understand what, uh, what are the developmental programs that are uh, establishing rhythmic behavior in C. elegans. And so um, early on in my studies, I found that wind signaling played a part in a swimming in C. elegans. Um, and so wind signaling is known to be critical for, de for development um, through tissue organization, cell polarization, um, but specifically from a nervous system point of view, it's important for um, patterning of the nervous system, getting neurons to where they need to be, having neurons send their axons to their proper targets, as well as having neurons um, form their synapses so that they can send information properly. Um, and so wind signaling is uh, known to, uh, is conserved across species and is known to play a part in C. elegans development. Um, just some background on wind signaling. Uh, wind is a diffusible glycoprotein and binds to the, for its receptor and leads, depending on its receptor and its downstream signaling can lead to different off-target effects, whether that's turning on target genes or organizing the cytoskeleton and morphology of neurons. Um, so there are known C, uh, Wnt genes in C. elegans shown here. So there are five Wnt genes. I'm, in my um, project, I focused on these top four because this uh, MOM2 is uh, mutations in this allele are embryonically lethal. And so uh, the first thing I did um, in wanting to understand if we when signaling affects um, uh, swimming is I looked at these mutant swimming patterns. And so I know I haven't gone through this graph before, but um, on the X axis is time and on the Y axis is the length of the animal, this being the head and this being the tail. And so this is a wild type adult animals postural chymograph. And this just shows that these wild type animals swim with a very um, uh, succinct and a rhythmic behavior with these oscillating red and blue bars uh, showing that they're oscillating um, ventral and dorsal bends that are propagating down the length of the body while it swims. Either way, these animal, the wild type animals swim with a frequency close to two hertz. And so when we look at um, CWINT1 mutants and LIN44 mutants, well, we know that these mutations lead to unique uh, disruptions in the nervous system. They don't um, have any input on swimming. 
However, when we look at EGL 20 and C went 2, we see a, a statistically significant decrease in swimming frequency compared to wild type. So I wanted to understand these genes further and understand how they're regulating swimming. And so I'll just show my CWINT2 data for now. Um, when we look closer at the CWINT2 adult animal, we see that it can swim like an adult. I'm sorry if the video is a little bit slowed. However, it gets stuck in this coiled position and then it comes out and we'll be able to ri produce rhythm again and then it'll coil again. So these uh, CWINT2 adult animals have a very unique, pheno uh, unique coiled phenotype um, shown here. They spend about 10% of their time in this coiled position. So my next, um, the next thing I wanted to see is how these, um, which receptor that uh, CWINT2 was functioning through to regulate this behavior. And so there are known WINT receptors in C. elegans shown here. I looked at the ones highlighted in green, and I found that these first three showed no phenotype. However, I did find a phenotype in CAM1 mutants. And um, interestingly, um, others have found that CWINT2 uh, binds to CAM1 for uh, nervous system development in C. elegans. Um, and so when looking at CAM1, we saw a similar phenotype in a decrease in swimming frequency, as well as an increase in time spent coiling, indicating to me that um, CWINT2 and CAM1 might be functioning within the same pathway. Um, <clears throat> and so with this, I found, I'll summarize this part. I found that EGL20 and CWIN2 uh, both regulate swimming. I found a possible receptor of CWIN2. Um, and then, I, um, so this brought me to my hypothesis, hypothesis that different winds regulate swimming at different developmental stages. Um, and these are my three aims. I'm interested in understanding how wind signaling contributes to rhythmic activity uh, through development. So I'm planning on looking at wind, uh, uh, my wind mutants at juvenile stages, and I'm further interested in the neurons that these wind receptors are at that are regulating this behavior. And I'm also interested in understanding how wind signaling um, regulates gait transition. So crawling to swimming and swimming to crawling. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank my lab and everyone that's helped me and my, the undergraduate mentees in my lab. And yeah, thank you, Damia. I'll take any questions. Very cool work I'm looking at rhythmic behaviors in the C. elegans. Um, I was just curious how, I, I think if anyone has any questions, they can just drop it in the chat. We have probably time for just one question before we need to move on to our next speaker. Um, I was just wondering how do you how do you go about automating the measurements of the C. elegans is with like some sort of like do you hit is are those all hand scored or do you have like some computer vision? Techniques? Yeah, it's a good question. I use a software. Um, essentially, something takes a video of these worms and uh, is able. I didn't show that today because I didn't have enough time. But yeah, I have a software and they automatic do that automatically. And then I'm also looking to do computational analyses and doing a principal component analyses of these worms to understand their specific um, behaviors. So yeah, that's a good point. And do you see do you see any differences uh, when they're younger in the in terms of age, those, uh, I guess, juvenile first adult? Yeah, um, actually in the wild type animals, we do see a difference. They're able to generate this rhythmic pattern, but they're uh, just way more disrupted. Um, it's not consistent. Um, and our CWINT2 mutants, when we look at the young animals, they have a more severe phenotype. So I'm thinking that maybe I talked about earlier how like the, um, they have an immature nervous system when they're first born. So maybe not having all those neurons or not having all those synapses is um, maybe exacerbating the phenotype at the juvenile stage. Very interesting. All right. Well, we'll need to move on to our next speaker who will be uh, Dr. Andrea Gomez. Um, Sarah, there's a question for you in the chat. If you want to answer it on, you can just type your answer. Um, Andrea, if you queue up your slides, feel free to take it away. All right, can you see the video? We oh, can sorry, see. see the slides. Okay. Okay. Uh, are we good to go? All right, thanks, Jesse. So um, yes, thank you again to the organizers of this uh, amazing uh, day. It's been so great to, to meet a bunch of indigenous scientists, kind of hear a bunch of perspective. I'm definitely inspired by 
um, all the talks that I've heard today. Um, so, you know, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Andrea Gomez. Um, I'm an assistant professor at UC Berkeley in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology, as well as the Helen Mills Neuroscience Institute. I'm also on the executive committee for the, the Berkeley Center for the Science of Psychedelics. Um, and I am a Laguna Pueblo and Chicana. Um, I was born and raised in Las Cruces, New Mexico, um, which is not um, my ancestral land. Our ancestral land here is in, in Parahi, um, about 50 miles west of Albuquerque. And this is uh, me, my mother, and my brother here um, next to my, my grandmother's house um, there in Parahi. Um, I am um, Big Oak Little Son. Um, and I guess, yeah, I'm happy to tell you about my journey to um, what we are studying here in my lab. So um, uh, a little bit about me and my, my, I guess my Western science training is I'm uh, trained as a developmental geneticist. And I suppose that you can say my scientific quest is to understand how we became so complex. Uh, more specifically, uh, what mechanisms provide the substrate for complexity to arise. And we want to link these complexity, gen complexity generating mechanisms um, to the way that fluctuating ionic current is patterned in single neurons to neural circuits. And this quest to understand these questions has led me to um, alternative RNA splicing. So I'm going to start by providing a framework for how my lab is thinking about um, the organizing signals of the brain. Um, you know, we want to know what's the nature of these signals, how do they organize, and while we know our genome contains the instructed cues, um, it cannot directly facilitate organization. Instead, it relies on RNA to coordinate instructed cues to alter neural circuit function. Um, really, what in our genome, what in our DNA is responsible for our thoughts, our memories, our feelings, and our behavior? Now, how do we even begin to ask how such an overwhelmingly complex structure such as the brain is organized? And I'm going to share some of the things that we discovered um, uh, and what we're looking to uh, here in my lab. So for the organizing signals, um, as the title suggests, I look to RNA for um, the organizing signals. And if there is one thing that I want you to remember today is that the complexity of our brain is matched by the complexity of our RNA. And we focus on how RNA diversity is generated in the brain and we link this diversity to the function of neural circuits. Um, and so what is this image that you have been looking at? Well, this is an entire mouse brain where we have genetically labeled a specific region called the hippocampus, which is a region that is crucial for learning and memory. Here is another view. Um, now, when we think about network activity propagating through this circuit, and it does so in this general direction, um, it is, uh, we know that the activity is not continuous. Um, it is in fact disrupted as activity passes from neuron to neuron throughout the circuit. Inputs summate, triggers an action potential and repeat. Now the fidelity of the transfer across um, the network relies profoundly on the connections or the synapses. And this is why I like synapses or why I am so interested in the properties of synapses because they have a profound effect in shaping the way that this neural activity is, is propagated throughout the network. But what are the cellular mechanisms for organizing these properties? Well, for one, we believe that a significant amount of the network is predetermined. Um, and we think that unique transcriptional programs that are activated in these distinct cell populations direct both the assembly as well as the maintenance of a network. And it is uh, my main goal to decode what molecular mechanisms that are contained in these cell type transcriptional repertoires that contribute to synaptic organization and function. And specifically those that contribute to synaptic properties. Now, if we zoom in on a single CA1 pyramidal neuron here in the hippocampus, we can appreciate that it is uh, um, contacted by many different uh, levels of stereotype synaptic specificity. And we can appreciate that it is targeted by different classes of neurons. 
uh, and cell types uh, specification enables all of these um, inputs to appropriately identify and synapse onto its target neuron with subcellular precision. Now, each of these connections also have different synaptic properties. For an example, one may have a specific neurotransmitter that mediates excitatory or inhibitory currents. Another may uh, target special components to the presynaptic terminal that tunes the probability of synaptic vesicle fusion, resulting in a facilitating or a depressing synapse. Um, one synapse may have special plasticity features such that when triggered by a strong or specific stimulus, increase the number of neurotransmitter receptors in the postsynaptic membrane, thus strengthening synaptic transmission. And what we want to know is how are these properties established? Now, um, I wanna take you through kind of our, our, our hypothesis for how this can arise from, a molecular, from molecular signaling. And we believe that this occurs through transsynaptic signaling modules or transsynaptic linkers each expressed by the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell that when bound, bring in cis together the components of the presynaptic release machinery, as well as signal across the synapse to organize postsynaptic receptors um, at the membrane. And we define this um, uh, transsynaptic signaling module as the minimum unit that can facilitate this organizing activity. Now, these modules, which we envision as senders and receivers, um, transmit organizing signals that depends on the identity of the transsynaptic linkers. Now here, depending on the, the, the synaptic context, say the brain region or the cell type, the content of, this, uh, uh, of these message can act to drive overlapping elements of synaptic organization, such as bidirectional adhesion, presynaptic vesicle recruitment, our postsynaptic stabilization of neurotransmitter receptors. Okay, so here comes kind of the paradox. The limiting factor for how many different types of synaptic properties that can be achieved is simply the number of available senders and receivers, um, which brings me to alternative splicing. So to illustrate my point, uh, we have about 20,000 genes, mice have about 20,000 genes, and even the worm C. elegans has about 20,000 genes. However, mice um, with, or sorry, humans with our 90 billion neurons um, make about 600 trillion to two quadrillion synapses. Mouse, mice with their 75 million neurons um, uh, make about half or half a trillion to two trillion synapses. And the worm with his 302 neurons, um, actually, I need to update this. Thank you, Sarah, uh, Sarah uh, make about 8,000 synapses, um, which tells us that the number of genes does not scale with brain complexity. And this is why I'm interested in alternative RNA splicing. So we all know the central dogma um, where DNA gets read into RNA and then RNA gets read into protein. But before RNA can be read into protein, it needs to mature. Introns need to be cut out and exons spliced together. Um, and what can happen during the splicing process is that occasionally a, a skipping event can be made. And this happens um, here's another kind of way to diagram this, is this happens through um, cis and transacting factors that recognize motifs in these structures uh, within the exons or within the introns um, to generate distinct isoforms or distinct um, versions of the same gene. Um, now, relating this back to this uh, uh, synapse, um, uh, here, we have a mechanism that can vastly expand the coding power of the synaptic proteome. Um, for an example, so from one single gene, we can now make, make multiple copies of, of the same, um, or from the same um, starting point. So um, uh, one uh, additional um, uh, feature of this, besides the fact that splicing um, can expand the coding power of the genome, is that the compared to any other tissue in the body, um, the extent of uh, alternative splicing um, uh, happens higher in the brain compared to any other tissue. Um, and importantly, the extent of alternative splicing scales with network complexity. 
with the highest degree um, observed in primates. So um, now getting into the data, um, we were interested in what mechanisms can contribute to the generation of these diversity, are these diverse um, diversity generate, or what are the facilitators of the diversific, diversifying um, uh, mechanisms. So this is why we looked to RNA binding proteins or proteins that can potentially bind to the RNA as it's being made and potentially bias particular isoforms from being made. And so here I want to introduce you into the RNA binding protein SLM2. And for the reasons stated before, we became extremely interested because we found that it displays non-overlapping expression in various cell types in the brain, right? If we want to think that there are different um, uh, isoforms being made across the brain, we would want them to have an, happen in non-overlapping patterns so that there can be cell type specific um, um, choices that are made. And we got excited, uh, our, and we made, uh, um, and we made a, a generate, or rather, um, we generated SLM2 NACA animals, and we got motivated that perhaps SLM2 had some function in the CNS because they had a weird behavioral phenotype, and that they had unusual response to novelty. So normally, when a wild type mouse is placed in uh, in an arena with two identical objects. And then you replace one of the objects with a novel object, the a mouse will normally go and explore that new object. Whereas our SLM2 knockout animals um, um, uh, displayed no interest in the in the uh, in the new object. And in fact, it, uh, it displayed a preference for the, the old um, familiar object. Um, now we don't believe that this was caused by an anxiety-like feature because when we tested them in different anxiety assays, such as an example here is the elevated plus maze, shows that SLM2 mice um, did not avoid um, the open arms of the maze. So again, just to remind you, this is an RNA binding protein. Um, now, uh, does the loss of this RNA binding protein um, that is causing these uh, novelty defects and behavior associated with changes in um, the transcriptome. So to determine what, if any, changes were made, we performed a comprehensive global analysis by whole genome RNA-seq and using um, parodying sequences of, of, of libraries prepared from wild type or SLM2 knockout hippocampus um, shows highly correlated expression levels. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that RNA, uh, or the knockout of this RNA binding protein, did not, does not tune or does not change overall RNA levels. Now, what about splicing? Um, now, here is a volcano plot where each dot is an exon, and we can see here on the y-axis the statistical differences um, comparing wild type um, and knockout uh, SLN to hippocampal tissues and the differences in whether or not an exon was included or excluded. And what we can see here is that only a handful of exons were deregulated. And this was an ex a pretty surprising result because most known RNA binding proteins regulate hundreds, if not thousands of transcripts. And perhaps more impressively, um, that these deregulated exons uh, in code for the synaptic adhesion proteins, um, norexin 1, 2, and 3, as well as the syntaxin binding protein, Thomasin 2. All of these which localize to the presynaptic terminal. So now, um, what um, exons do these encode for? So um, the exon that was changed um, in SM2 knockout was uh, this uh, exon um, at this alternative slice site 4. Here you can see uh, a qPCR of hippocampal tissue in wild type versus SLM2 knockout. And what I hope you can appreciate that normally in wild type, you have um, both isoforms or both versions of this um, splice site at this alternative splice site for present in wild type tissue. However, when you um, knock out SLM2, the RNA binding protein, we lose this skipping ability um, in the tissue and see now all norexin 1, 2, and 3 isoforms are shifted up to contain the exon. Now, what can this change about the, the function of, of the synapses? Well, these, um, this region encodes, here I've mapped these regions onto the part of the protein which encodes this, um, this region, and you can see that uh, increasing or decreasing the length of protein that sits 
on the top of this um, interface here actually encodes for known ligand interfaces with other synaptic genes. So now um, what happens whenever we take a look at the synapse, um, when we look at the AMPA receptor levels, which are the um, glutamate um, neurotransmitter receptors, we can see that the glue A1 subunit is elevated in our S12 knockout animals. Um, further, when we uh, look at the strength of synaptic excitation of, um, uh, of these synapses, we can see that uh, deleting SLM2 um, results in a, a stronger um, uh, synaptic excitation, which, which does make sense because we, do, we are seeing an elevated AMPA receptors um, in, the, in the tissue. Now, because we know that AMPA receptors are critical for synaptic plasticity, uh, we employed a, a synaptic plasticity paradigm um, in recorded CA1 neurons, whereby if um, we induce uh, a, a high um, uh, and strong um, uh, burst of stimuli, normally wild type synapses strengthen, whereas our SLM2 knockouts fail to undergo long-term potentiation, um, which we, again, we know a process that's critical on AMPA receptor regulation. So um, I just kind of want to take a moment just to summarize what we found here, which is that I set out to ask if alternative splicing was important for um, the specification of synaptic properties. And when we just dis, uh, disrupted a splicing regulator by knocking out SLM2, which is an RNA binding protein, we found that it is critical for the selective regulation at the RNA level. It wasn't up regulation or down regulation of specific genes, but specifically splicing was disrupted. Now at the level of the synapse, we get a remarkably selective phenotype marked by a change in the levels of AMPA receptors, which was coordinate with an increase in uh, synaptic excitation. And since norexins were targeted by SLM2, we hypothesize that norexin splicing in the presynaptic uh, neuron generates a transsynaptic signal that coordinates the, the magnitude of synaptic strength or um, um, the strength that's mediated by amber receptors. Now, if this hypothesis is true, then deleting the RNA binding protein only in the presynaptic neuron should produce the same phenotype. And this experiment is important because it would also rule out the possibility that the phenotype that we are observing is coming um, indirectly from somewhere else in the circuit where SLM2 is expressed. And finally, to prove that this transsynaptic signal is indeed carried out by norexins, we restored uh, norexin um, isoform levels um, in the presynaptic neuron. So first to probe presynaptic function, um, we made a conditional um, knockout of SLM2 by introducing a CA3 specific pre um, and crossing them into SLM2 flops alleles. Um, and to confirm the specificity of this um, pre driver, um, we cross this line into a flops TD tomato mouse and assess the extent of pre recombination using two photon tomography. Um, and here you can see the image of the entire brain. And what I hope you can appreciate is just how selective this CRE driver is. Um, we are able to really fine tune um, change uh, the genetic um, uh, information in the presynaptic neuron. Okay, so now crossing this CRE driver into SLM2 flops mice, we were able to generate a targeted deletion of SLM2 from CA3 neurons, um, here shown by an 80% reduction in the SLM2 uh, nu positive nuclei in the, in the presynaptic neurons or in these CA3 neurons. So now what happens to splicing in these neurons? Um, now before we did an RNA-seq and we assessed the, the splicing pattern in, in the whole hippocampal tissue, um, but now we need to selectively look at the transcriptome only from CA3 neurons. And to achieve this, we use this ribotag technique, whereby ribosomes get selectively labeled um, with this HA tag in a Cree-dependent manner. Um, then these tag ribosomes can be pulled down and we can assess the RNAs that are attached to these tag ribosomes. Now, if we look at the um, CA3, or rather wild type CA3 neurons, we can appreciate that norexin splicing is almost entirely excluded at this fourth position. Um, where on the other hand, selectively deleting SLM2 
only from CA3 neurons results in a loss in this splicing at this fourth position. And now we see transcripts that contain this exon. Now, because of this highly selective expression um, of the Cree driver, we can now directly test the effects of norexin splicing onto downstream targets. Now remember, I'm only deleting SLM2 from these CA3 neurons, from the presynaptic neurons, and we are able to record from wild type um, CA1 neurons. And when we measure the magnitude of synaptic strength onto wild type neurons that are contacted by mutant CA3 neurons, indeed, we see an elevation in excitation, which confirms <laughs> that splicing in the presynaptic neuron instructs for postsynaptic strength in, in the CA1 neurons. Now, because we are able to see um, what these, uh, the effects of the um, elevated synaptic excitation is on these CA1 neurons, um, we're able to ask, well, how does synaptic excitation you know, change any properties about the, these wild type CA1 neurons? And indeed, if we um, do current clamp uh, experiments um, and inject various amount of currents, we can see that in our uh, neurons that are contacted by mutant CA3 axons, we actually see a diminishing or a decrease in the firing frequency of these neurons. Now, this may sound counterintuitive. We see how we have this elevated synaptic strength, but now we're seeing the neurons that are um, um, being uh, are having their activity reduced. Now, we also looked at um, other um, potential currents that can be contributing to this, this phenotype of reduction of um, um, firing frequency. And we identified a, an elevated uh, currents of these HCN channels um, that are recorded in these neurons that are contacted by mutant CA3 neurons. Now, um, to take a look at other properties, such as the action potential, we, we see an expected shape. Um, such as the threshold, the, the height, and other features about this action potential, um, which shows that these um, elevated synaptic currents or the elevated synaptic strength onto these wild type neurons um, decrease its firing frequency and increase these IH currents without changing the potential output that the CA neuron was going um, to, 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 to forward into the rest of the circuit. Okay, so. To kind of um, to kind of wrap up a bit, these um, results argue that specifically SLM2 in the presynaptic neuron generates a transsynaptic signal that is responsible for a phenotype in the target CA1 neuron primal neurons. Now, like I said, we believe that this is mediated by norexins, um, but to test this and to confirm that it is in fact uh, norexins, what we did is we um, generated a conditional allele in norexin to mimic the splicing activity of SLM2 that's um, at that alternative splice site four. So by placing these flux uh, sites around the, um, the, this alternative splice star region and we um, hit, hit these animals with Cree, um, we can effectively mimic what SLM2 is doing. And so what I wanna demonstrate here is that when we rescue a single copy of norexin, the elevated amper receptor um, uh, uh, phenotype that we saw before um, is now restored down to, to wild type levels here in this Western blot from hippocampal tissue. Um, further, the uh, plasticity defect caused by SLM2 deficiency um, was also partially restored. And, and finally, the, the weird uh, novelty um, behavior in SLM2 knockout mice was also restored to wild type levels. Okay, so as I mentioned in the beginning, I set up to identify uh, molecular mechanisms that specify synaptic properties, and I shared my vision of how a synaptic adhesive code can manifest in the central nervous system. Um, but how robust is this code um, from mice to humans, um, when especially you consider that from mice to humans, you change the number of neurons by an order of magnitude. And this is why I'm so interested in alternative splicing, because this mechanism can increase the coding power of the genome without disrupting the underlying evolutionarily conserved gene expression patterns and overlay another level of complexity. But for this to make sense in the brain, a highly heterogeneous system, 
increasing complexity or increasing molecular complexity needs to happen in a selective way. And then as I showed, we discovered a, a spicing program that's dedicated to the spicing of synaptic adhesion molecules. And when this disrupted, not only did it alter behavior, but it also disrupted uh, synaptic excitation and synaptic plasticity in the hippocampus. And importantly, by selectively disrupting plasticity in a subset of neurons, this demonstrated that uh, alternative splicing can shape neural circuitry um, in cell type specific ways. Okay, so now um, our discovery, you know, that splicing can shape neural circuitry is just a uh, one study in a growing body of evidence that's shown by us and others that splicing is a powerful mechanism for network organization and function. Um, now, uh, kind of looking forward, um, what types of questions are we looking to pursue? You know, as I showed, um, we're looking at how, you know, splicing is regulating synaptic function in a single pathway, but CA1 neurons integrate other streams of information like such from the cortex. Um, and in fact, the timing of these inputs are critical for um, how, the, the, um, how the, the hippocampus integrates information from across the brain. Um, uh, another question we're interested in is to see if these splicing uh, uh, patterns are conserved in a related nervous system, which is our enteric nervous system, which is a system of about 500 million neurons that line our entire digestive tract. Um, and finally, the, the last set of um, um, projects in my lab, um, we are interested in uh, CRISPR um, um, mediated um, plasticity therapeutics and we're using psychedelics um, to, to ask two questions. One is what can psychedelics teach us about the brain? Um, and two, can we mimic uh, psychedelic induced plasticity? And I just have one more slide um, to kind of um, uh, talk about and try to recruit, you know, and talk about the second uh, Western psychedelic renaissance. And I think this is a critical time for indigenous contributions and voices in psychedelic. Um, we know that psychedelics have been used for thousands of years to engage cognitive connection and open pathways to healing. Um, and I kind of want to mention a cautionary tale. Um, we, we know that Maria Sabina, who was a, a, a curandera, a healer in, in the Mazatec community, um, was contacted by uh, this journalist, George Wasson, who published um, uh, you know, her, some of her practices um, here on this corny cover with the title, The Discovery of Mushrooms That Cause Strange Vision. And um, you know, this initiated a huge migration to her village. The villagers attacked, tried to burn her down her house several times. Um, and she was really ostracized. And, and she spent her last years in abject poverty and, mal and malnutrition, and she eventually died in 1985. Now, I think right now we, you know, need to kind of consider this, you know, kind of critical um, time where we need to acknowledge and promote indigenous contributions um, to this work, and at the same time protecting our sacred our knowledge. And this is especially in light of, and I just checked this this morning, is that two um, psychedelic pharma companies, the two prominent ones, the Thai Life Sciences and Compact. Compass Pathways are at a $3 billion um, uh, dollar market cap. Now, um, to kind of go back on this relationship between Maria Sabina is she gave this knowledge to the Western world and died in poverty. And I think this is a critical time that we can reclaim some um, of, this, of these uh, uh, resources. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. Sorry for going over time, but I, this is my lab. Um, and uh, I want to especially thank Lisa Tronmuller, who was a grad student who I worked with during my postdoc in, in Switzerland. Um, and also, I'll, I'll leave it to you for questions. That was a very cool talk. Thank you for sharing with us your work. Um, I think we have time for just one quick question before we need to move on to the next speaker. So, if anyone. Hi, Andrea. I had I had a question. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if it's known how the spliced form or failure to splice these norexin proteins results in AMPAR upregulation. Yeah. So it, the 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 splicing of these um, presynaptic molecules um, are um, actually I, I do have. Uh, 
that slide, but for a time, the, the, this splice isoformate changes the ligand affinity for known postsynaptic ligands. And so um, we, what happens is we, um, we actually lose the affinity uh, of, are these isoforms lack the ability to bind to known, um, it's, it's known ligands. So this is demonstrated here. So if we pull down Norex and, and uh, uh, look at um, the um, uh, postsynaptic interaction in early in one and three, we lose this affinity in our less than two knockouts. So the, um, these postsynaptic ligands are, are known to organize amperoceptors of the postsynaptic membrane. Okay, awesome. Yeah. yeah great talk. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I, because of time, I will um, uh, ask, uh, answer Sarah, uh, Sarah's um, uh, question in the chat. Yes, that would be great. Thank you, Andrea. Um, yeah, so we will move on to our next speaker, who will be Lori. If you queue up your slides, that would be great. Um, Lori will be giving uh, another student talk on their research. So feel free to start. Um, hi, uh, first, uh, Yate, Shay, Lori, Vie, and Chia, Tohan, and Nishla, Tatnazani, Bushes, Chin, Loga, Dinesh, Che, Glashe, Deshanella. I'm just introducing myself in my native tongue. Uh, hi, my name is Lori Vie. I am of the Near Water people, born for the Tangle clan. My maternal grandfather is of the Reed people, and my paternal grandfather is of the Red Bottom people. Um, I'd like to first thank the organizers and those um, wanting me and uh, asking me to speak here today on kind of my journey into science and research. Um, first starting, um, I'm from Blanding, Utah, um, a small rural town um, here where um, I kind of, where I grew up and um, definitely grew up with uh, needing thick skin with uh, four older brothers. Um, but within my community, I really um, came to learn and see how much access to healthcare was needed because, for example, when I was little, I nearly broke my leg and I had to wait like a day until I could have a physician see me and put a cast on my leg. Um, but thankfully, um, that's changed <laughs> due to some great and amazing trailblazers in the community coming together and actually uh, building a a uh, whole healthcare system. And now currently there is a hospital and a healthcare system um, in Blanding and the surrounding communities. And unfortunately enough, um, one of those trailblazers is actually my mom. Um, and seeing her do all of these amazing things and um, continuing to better and help our community um, inspired me when I was little to want to go into med school and um, pursue an MD PhD and um, want to go kind of on that um, and on that path, definitely. Um, so getting educated, I went to Utah State and got my associates, and then I transferred to the University of Utah. Um, in transferring to the University of Utah, I definitely um, felt and got culture shock. Um, University of Utah is definitely a predominantly white institution, and I <laughs> was really um, struggling for a while until I found the American Indian Resource Center, which is actually um, the University of Utah is the only university that has a standalone American Indian um, Resource Center, which is amazing. And through there, I found my community and I found people um, also in pursuit of similar goals and trying to achieve that and get um, with their education. And through the Resource Center, there were amazing um, social opportunities to meet others in ver ver uh, varying fields. And I was actually able to meet with a very um, impactful and pivotal person that um, definitely started my interest into the sciences. Because um, before uh, meeting this person, I really didn't know what research, what went into research or what um, a scientist actually did or um, that scientists weren't what I saw depicted in TV shows and movies. Um, and that person was actually Judy Simcox. Um, and it took some persistence, <laughs> but being able to get into the lab and being able to um, see and um, see what actually goes into science and seeing what scientists actually do was amazing. And also seeing someone of um, 
an indigenous background and seeing representation definitely um, gave me the sense that I could do this myself. Um, so in the villain of the lab, I was able to um, look into the functional characteristics of um, a specific gene in adipose tissue and um, being able to work with um, mice and um, see that differences. And that actually brought me back to my community and my culture because when dissecting mice, I actually um, brought me back to butchering sheep. So in my family, um, in my culture, we butcher sheep and we use all of the organs and every organ and uh, part of the animal has meaning, um, which gave me a great um, kind of leg up going into dissecting mice because I already knew that um, tissue and skin elasticity and the strength of skin in a sense. And um, which brought me more closer to why research is so impactful um, as an indigenous person and seeing the whole physiology um, of research in that side um, definitely gave me um, definitely gave me an opportunity and chances and to uh, feed my curiosity. Um, so I, they really gave me the chance to present a paper or present a poster at the SACNIS conference and actually get a few publications um, through them. And with knowing Judy and um, being able to know um, many more people within the university and getting networked in and connected, um, I actually was able to be a part of the NARI program. So the NARI program is um, for, it's a Native American research internship that's here held at the University of Utah. And uh, I participated in that over the summer um, a few years ago. And I was able to be paired in the Dubink lab. And we focused on data analysis within maternal fetal medicine. Um, so looking back into patient charts and getting to see a different, uh, different side of research, not necessarily basic lab, um, which was good for me and being able to create my own question and being able to um, conduct um, research on that side. And then um, once that research ended, I got into the Kelly lab, which also is in data analysis and that um, looking into um, healthcare access within uh, American Indian and non-American Indian communities with opioid use disorder and pregnancy. Um, definitely um, also was very impactful seeing that side of a different type of data analysis, being able to see the survey side and um, really um, hit home for me because I was able to um, reach out to these communities in Utah and uh, my own communities and seeing how well we are helping and giving access to needed care for this specific population um, with them. But also these opportunities um, kind of verified to me how much I wanted to get back to uh, basic lab science. And now in my current lab, the Shea lab, looking into um, the relationships between nutrition and circadian and the circadian clock to help um, and find different therapeutic strategies to increase health span and well-being across the human's lifespan. Um, and with my own um, specific project within that is looking into the effect of cognitive, um, cog um, cognitive um, differences in dietary restricted mice with Alzheimer's, um, which has been amazing to me. Learning more about this um, has definitely brought new types of research to me um, within that uh, and looking into Alzheimer's, I actually found that um, future aims that I kind of want to um, possibly pursue in the future um, with my goal of actually becoming an MD-PhD. So being able to um, be a physician, give healthcare, uh, be able to provide healthcare and see patients, but also being able to research um, and it was brought to me that there are relationships between diabetes and dementia and diabetes, of course, we know that is an ongoing epidemic within um, American Indian populations and um, dementia hits home for me because um, during my middle school and high school years, I really helped my parents take care of my grandparents who had severe dementia and seeing them and 
um, having those experiences um, definitely feeds into why I want to um, look at these relationships and see how we could um, find different things about these connections and being able to um, help our community or help our communities in that way um, is kind of where I'm thinking I'm wanting to go in the future and um, what I'm wanting to research um, when getting into my pro uh, these programs that I hopefully will soon be applying to. Um, and to kind of finish that, I just want to thank the Shea Lab and the Dubink Lab and the Kelly Lab for giving me all the opportunities to um, learn more about research, really honing in on what I'm wanting to research or how I'm wanting to research. Um, and then the Villanueva Lab for really sparking my interest and in letting me know that research is a thing that I can do and seeing representation um, from Judy Simcox has been a big um, pivotal point for me in my journey to where I'm wanting to be and all the mentors who's helped me um, get to where I am and kind of helped me get to where I'm wanting to go um, has been amazing. And of course, the University of Utah where all of these labs are um, and all the um, things I've been able to do through them and offered through them. Um, I can't thank you for <laughs> listening to my journey to research. I'd like to ask a question, if that's all right. Um, you knew I would, Laurie, don't worry. <laughs> um, so in your journey, I think what it is is a good highlight of things that are really important for Native researchers from research programs that uh, provide support for Natives and community cultural mentors like the Native American Research Internship, um, Native mentors uh, and science mentors, and then also the importance of finding community and finding the value you bring to community. Um, and I, I personally loved your title too, just because I remember I remember when you first found out that you were really good at mouth surgeries and it was because you knew the strength of skin. Um, but I guess the one thing I'm curious about would be if you could dream of something else that would have really helped you in discovering research and as you're applying to your MD PhD programs, what would you, what component would you build and provide for others? Good question. <laughs> um, I would have to say more exposure to representation. If I had better um, and more equipped counseling during high school, um, would have definitely given me um, the chance and the opportunity to see that research was a possibility. Um, also, like in a rural, small community, all you really think of is the basics um, as possible career paths um, as a student. And also, um, yeah, I think just that would be more so of what I hope, I kind of wish I had um, at the beginning, because then that would have answered a lot of questions that I have now and, and um, kind of would have prevented me from going on different um, unnecessary paths to get where I am um, and averted obstacles also. Um, but yeah. So just out of curiosity, I want to follow up on that. So like would you would like visiting high school, like visiting your high school, having some researchers visit your high school, would that have been helpful for you? And coming out into your rural community and just being like, hey, research exists. It's this career. You can get paid to do science. It's super cool. <laughs> and you can help your community. Something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be very beneficial. Like if I saw that um, someone coming to my community in high school and showing me these things, that would have been amazing. Like I still have some family members who think it's crazy that I get paid to test mice <laughs> and work with mice. Um, but knowing that and seeing like how you can answer questions this way, um, I think I think would have been amazing to have and have out that outreach um, in rural communities would would have been great. Thanks for so, that feedback. Oh yeah, thanks for sharing with us your journey. I wish you the best of luck in applying this upcoming or whenever you apply.
Yeah, um, exactly. Thank you. All right, well, we'll need to move on to our next talk. Um, Khalid Clay will be speaking to us about his or their research. So feel free to start. We can see your slides. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Thumbs up. Cool. Uh, sweet. So uh, let's see here. Let me restart my camera. There we go. Thanks for coming to my talk today. My name is Khalid Clay. I am a fifth year graduate student in, uh, at the Scripps Research Institute in the Petrushek lab. My talk is titled Kinship, Caretaking, and C. elegans, the Chemical Biology of Aging. Uh, my project aims to link health and disease by examining how changes in translation relates to protein aggregation. Uh, and I do this using the sort of deep kinship that I've developed with C. elegans over the past five years. What, am I, what I mean by kinship and C. elegans is a sort of a personal project that I've undertaken where I try my best to situate the multiple relations I have with these animals rather than merely thinking about them as a tool. To do this, I borrow language from other places outside of sort of like chemistry and biology from like uh, Linda Smith's uh, decolonizing methodologies where I'm offering a counter story of kinship with these animals rather than extracting knowledge from an object of study. A lot of these ideas of kinship are also grounded in the work of Dr. Kim Talbear, uh, for example, this idea of caretaking relations. Uh, I like to joke that my longest relationship in graduate school has been with these worms. <laughs> but really think about it. Uh, I hand make their food every week, uh, which is a type of E. coli bacterial. Uh, I check in on them three times a week to do my longevity experiments. And I interact with, have interacted with over a hundred generations of these animals during my PhD work. Um, for the sake of time though, that's where I'm gonna stop on this developing project because I'm still thinking through these ideas with a lot of other people that I'm um, in relation with. So now I wanna give a broad overview on my work involving chemical biology of aging. Specifically, my work is focused on how polyzone mediated translation drives aggregation. What we're looking at on the left here is what is called a polyzone profile in which uh, we're able to separate different ribosomal species by running them through a sucrose gradient and detect it uh, through UV-Vis. On the right is another polyzone profile, but in this case, uh, these cells were treated with small molecule minocycline, which is gonna be much of the focus of my talk today. Uh, I wanna explore how this molecule minocycline reduces polyzones, uh, in other words, reduces ribosomal load and how that's going to affect aggregation. And I wanna make the case that specifically reducing ribosomal load is sufficient to reduce aggregation. Much research is dedicated to aging and many labs have found many small molecules that extend lifespan. But these studies are typically given to animals throughout their entire life, which is not viable in a human clinical setting. A previous graduate student in my lab, Greg Solis, uh, screened a bunch of molecules to see which one specifically extended life in aged animals. Uh, the basic idea of this approach is that the most interesting molecule for drug discovery will be those that work in old animals. One molecule, one of the very few molecules that worked in the study was called minocycline, which uh, I'll be talking about now. Minocycline uh, was shown in Greg's eLife paper in 2018 to uh, reduce global translation. Uh, one of the methods he used to show this was activity-based proteomic profiling, but he also identified many other factors within the translation apparatus that can uh, be uh, explored. So this is kind of the meat and potato slide that I wanna get at. Um, that's that extrinsic aspects of translation may alter your aggregation propensity. Uh, this is based on three observations. The first one is that newly synthesized proteins are the most vulnerable to aggregation. Uh, there's a lot of work on this, so I won't specifically discuss that one. Number two is that polyzone mediated translation may contribute to aggregation. Here's a, uh, a picture of an ongoing translated mRNA with many, many ribosomes on it. And what we see is simply that towards the end of this mRNA at the greatest ribosomal load is the most crowded macromolecular environment. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, minocycline suppresses both polyzone formation and aggregation, uh, which we can see with these overlaid polyzone profiles here. Another thing um, is that minocycline specifically reduces heat shock induced protein aggregation, where this lane depicts a lot of aggregates and treatment with uh, minocycline aggregates that effect. 
So the general hypothesis in my PhD work is that the propensity of newly synthesized proteins to aggregate is mediated by factors like ribosomal load. To identify these polysome mediated transcripts, what I did is I isolated and um, performed RNA sequencing on these various ribosomal species, and then develop a, uh, a bioinformatic pipeline to separate and identify the specific transcripts that lie in the monosome fraction versus the transcripts that lie in the polysome fraction. And then what I did is I combined this data set with some TMT proteomics for expression levels and found in literature uh, aggregation prone proteins that may aggregate upon feed shock. The overlap of this data was about 37 proteins and um, I'm plotting them all right here. What we're looking at on this graph on the y-axis is relative protein levels. And on the x-axis is this sort of metric that's uh, referred to as polysome enrichment, where an enrichment of one would mean that transcripts are equally uh, translated in either monosomes or polysomes. Further to the right would be polysome-mediated transcripts. And what you can see is a lot of green dots. There are, is a preference for aggregation-prone proteins to be polysome enriched. As I discussed here on the left, uh, increasing ribosomal load may lead to increasing aggregation. And we can use existing chemical matter, in this case, minocycline, to specifically suppress polysome formation and see what consequences that's going to have on aggregation. To cut to the chase, what I found is that minocycline specifically re um, reduces polysome enrichment of these aggregation prone proteins. On the left are the aggregation from proteins that I showed before. On the right is that same kind of graph, but instead um, these cells have been treated with minocycline. And what you see is a collapse in the uh, species of uh, ribosomes that these transcripts are found in rich, and rather it's more of a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. Um, and rather than there being 65% of aggregation from proteins being polysome enriched, now that's reduced to uh, about 43%, which is close to 50-50. So that's where I'm going to stop there. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the, the interpretations of this data. And that may suggest or be interpreted that um, inhibiting translation alone is sufficient to prevent heat shock aggregation within the proteostasis network because protein production is the biggest load on this system. Uh, it requires the most ATP. And I want to show that minocycline has this unique aspect um, over different modes of translation inhibition. And that's the data I'm going to show now. So proteostasis turns out to be differently regulated by um, initiation or elongation inhibitors. First thing I did is confirm a series of small molecule translation inhibitors uh, work at inhibiting translation in C. elegans using a pyramycin incorporation assay in which pyramycin is incorporated into newly synthesized proteins. And we can read that out uh, with an antibody in normal Western blood. And all of these molecules reduce translation, but I wanted to focus on four specific ones, anazomycin, lycrin, or E1R-cat, and salubrinol. Um, these four molecules, I kind of are obviously uh, structurally distinct, but inhibit different modes of translation, be it elongation or initiation. And to interrogate this question, I had to develop a new system. Uh, I use high content image analysis and um, performed heat shock induced protein aggregation on a uh, traditional reporter of aggregation. In this case, it's a polyglutamine used to YFP. Kind of hard to see on this background, but um, this diffuse puncta should localize into, or diffuse signal should localize into discrete puncta that represent aggregates. And what you see is that after a two hour heat shock, that's precisely what happens. Over this 15 hour live imaging window, we see the increasing amount of puncta form following a two hour heat shock. Then if we take these, uh, this system and treat the worms with different translation inhibitors and ask which ones will prevent heat shock induced aggregation, what I found is that only anazomycin and lycrin surprisingly um, prevented this type of aggregation from happening. Moving on, um, what I also found is that thermal tolerance is required for uh, H, uh, requires HSF1 for specifically for initiation inhibitors. HSF1 is a, a master regulator of the heat shock response and um, is really important for proteostasis. In wild type worms, which is denoted by N2, both elongation and initiation inhibitors pr uh, protect 
uh, from heat shock. But in this HSF1 deficient mutant worm, um, only elongation inhibitors protect from them. Uh, initiation inhibitors do no longer protect, which is very fascinating. One of the other things that I don't have time to talk about because I'm running out of time, that's really cool though, is that longevity is differentially modulated by initiation elongation inhibitors, where wild type worms, if you treat them with a drug, uh, elongation inhibitors, nothing happens. But if they are deficient in their heat shock response in this particular mutant, then there is an effect. And the reverse is true for initiation inhibitors. Um, with that, I'd like to summarize that heat shock induced protein aggregation is independent of expression levels in HEC2 and Q cells. There are at least two mechanisms that link translation and longevity. Uh, inhibiting translation alone is insufficient to protect from protein aggregation or promote longevity. And finally, ongoing relations with C. elegans can teach us a lot about biology. Uh, with that, I'd like to take my lab, my committee, uh, the various funding agencies, and uh, I'd like to thank the audience, Shook. And uh, with that, I'll take any other questions. Oh, here it's a second. So can we, um, I don't know if you know, but I was the one who found out that heat shock proteins were essential in yeast. And also with Randy Sheckman in, in the Gunter Global, we had side-by-side -side nature papers finding out that uh, they were chaperones. <laughs> so yeah. uh, anyway, so that's it. That's how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> in that's any awesome, event, yeah, yeah, in any event, so this whole thing about aggregation, thermotolerance, all this stuff. So I worked on quiescent, quiescence in yeast. So mm -hmm. when yeast go into um, this late stage, and this is in stationary phase cultures, they form quiescent and non-quiescent cells. <clears throat> and in non-quiescent cells, there were all these massive aggregations that, mm -hmm. we, that we saw and they also saw at the Buck Institute. Um, so anyway, I think there may be some other literature out there for you. I don't know if they ever published all this stuff. We didn't, because we just like, what is this? You know, we were just like, you know, oh. <laughs> Every time we get it, it's like a bigger glob, you know, we can't find a column that will resolve this thing. And um, so, yeah, and so the one thing to pay attention to, I will tell you is something that we found was that when we were doing heat shock experiments in my lab, so we did uh, yeast thermotolerance, right? And we'd put it up at like, I don't know, whatever, 52 or whatever it was. What we were looking at live dead um, stains, and what we found was that many of the things that we thought killed cells did not, it just arrested them, okay? And so it's, it's interesting to pay attention to your, your cells looking at maybe like, you know, if you think you've killed parts of it by thermotolerance or something, just, you know, you may be finding out what, what we were wondering about is why thermotolerance stops things, right? With this, with this aggregation. So it's really cool. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't have a good question. I was like, all right, this is great. Sorry. I was <laughs> no, thank you for that. Uh, and a little bit of history. Uh, I love this because we found a lot of weird things and couldn't explain them until we returned to a lot of these old newspapers and then it all kind of fell into place in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, well, the cells differentiate and, and um, I don't know what happens in C. elegans, but it would be really interesting because so, so I will tell you in terms of in terms of indigenous paying attention to these organisms and stuff that they do a lot more. These cells do different things that people just grind them up and they and they don't really look at their cells. I can't, you couldn't believe it. They didn't look at their cells, you know. So if you love these worms, you know they will tell you things that that you know because because we only ask the questions about things that we're experienced with. So to ask really new questions, the worms are gonna to have to tell you. And so you have to, um, you know, you just, just think about it and it'll come. I mean, I, I miss watching yeast cells for hours at a time now, but it's, that's, that's I think where it's gonna come from. And you will find things that all these people didn't see because they were, they found what they were looking for, right? And, and, and you find what you're looking for, but you have to be open to finding really new things in your organism. I love that. Thank you.
Awesome. Well, if anyone has any more questions for, for COVID, uh, you can drop it in the Q&A. And fortunately, we need to keep on moving to our next talk, who will be uh, done by Dr. Chrissy Lyon, who is a postdoc at the Salk Institute. I believe I should have probably got that right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry, just sharing my screen. Okay. Yeah, so thanks so much for the opportunity to present my PhD work today. I'm currently a postdoc at the Salk Institute, but I'm going to be telling you about my work that I did during graduate school in the Demeki lab at Harvard Medical School. Um, I graduated in March. And so one of the questions that has been really interesting to me throughout my life, and it's also a central question in neuroscience, is how behavior is generated. Here I'm showing videos of my cats play fighting, hunting, and trying to gain access to a cat tree. These are spoiled hog cats, but for most organisms, gaining access to resources like food, shelter, um, and mates is essential for survival, all while avoiding threats, aggressors, and predators in an ever-changing environment. And these behaviors that we use to adapt and survive are generated through complex cellular interactions within the nervous system. One of the key neurotransmitters involved in this is serotonin. Here I'm showing a schematized cross-section of the human brain with serotonergic system labeled in blue. Serotonin is known for modulating many different behaviors, some of which I'm listing here. And when you read these specific behaviors, you may think of another neurotransmitter system, and that would be dopamine, which modulates many of these behaviors as well. And I was particularly interested in my PhD work about the interplay between these two neuro neuromodulatory systems due to the discovery of a specialized small subset of serotonergic neurons that express the type 2 dopamine receptor. So here in green, I'm showing a schematized neuron that expresses a dopamine receptor D2, but releases serotonin. And I thought this cell type was so interesting because it's a point of interaction between these two essential neuromodulatory systems. And I wanted to understand what is the behavioral importance of DRD2 expression in these serotonergic neurons. But before I dive into my research further, I wanna talk a little bit about my path to science. I'm originally from Arizona. Here I'm showing some pictures of my family, um, my parents um, in the lower corner, and then uh, my brother as well in the middle. Um, and so my dad is Navajo and worked really hard to be able to attend veterinary school and was a veterinarian. And so growing up, my brother and I were always playing with animals and I had a huge interest in why animals do the things that they do and the world around us. But the rote memorization of science classes in high school and middle school was really not for me. Um, it took away any of this natural wonder and the lack of women that I saw and the lack of women of color that I saw in science kind of spoke to me and said, this is not really a place for you. And so I went off to college thinking that I would probably study anything other than science. And this reminds me of this quote uh, from one of my favorite neuroscientists, Dr. Carla Schatz. In an interview, she was asked, what first interested you in science? And she answered, no one thing. The question one might ask, especially of young girls, and here this red asterisk is one that I added, is what turned you off of science? I think we have an innate interest in the world around us and often in scientific things. And I add this asterisk because I think this applies to all my normalized groups. We have this natural interest in science, but there are ways that we kind of get pushed down in this. And so I set off to college, totally not intending to study science, but I took a behavioral neuroscience course. And in talking to an important mentor of mine, Dr. Yu Ping Zhang, I asked her, you know, what does this mean? How does the brain make its behavior? When we say that the prefrontal cortex controls executive function, how is that happening? How are the cells doing that? And she nominated me for a um, undergraduate research program called XROP uh, that used to be run by HHMI. And I got to go to Baltimore and work at Johns Hopkins in the lab of David Ginty for the summer. This was my first research experience and my first time on the East Coast. And ultimately, I ended up staying in his lab for two years. He was a great mentor to me, as well as postdocs there, Dr. Kevin Wright and Dr. Vicki Abrera. And ultimately, I joined the Harvard program in neuroscience. 
where I was mentored by Dr. Susan Demecki, shown here. And she was an amazing supporter of me and allowed me to look at this question, how is behavior modulated? Specifically, what is the behavioral importance of DRD2 in these serotonergic neurons? And I did this using a mouse model system. So here I'm showing a, a coronal section of the mouse brain, and this is the dorsal raphe nucleus. This is where serotonin neurons have their cell bodies. All serotonin neurons are shown here in pink with PET1, which is a pan serotonergic transcription factor and marker. And then the ones that express this D2 dopamine receptor are shown in green. And you can tell that there's less of them. They are a specialized subset and they're only some of the serotonergic neurons. To examine what the role of DRD2 is in behavior, I use the Cree lock system to specifically delete DRD2 only in serotonin neurons and then query the behavior. As I mentioned at the beginning, serotonin and dopamine are involved in many different behavioral processes, including motor coordination, anxiety-like behavior, aggression. And so I assayed all of these behaviors in these mice, both male and female, uh, to determine what DRD2 might be involved in. And to make a long story short, I found dis differences in acoustic startle response and in the tube test of social dominance. Here I'm showing the acoustic startle response data. So what is the acoustic startle response? This is when you hear a loud noise, um, like somebody dropping something in a quiet library, and you jump. This is an evolutionarily conserved defensive mechanism so you can prepare in the event that there would be some threat. What interestingly, what I find is that females have an attenuation of this reflex, whereas males don't. On the flip side, in the tube test of social dominance, which I'm showing a video of here, two mice are placed to opposite ends of the tube. They can come together and the dominant mouse will push the other mouse out. And as you can note, this is the DRD2 conditional knockout male that's pushing the control out. And so here I see increased social dominance in the knockout males relative to the controls, but only in the males, not in the females. So to summarize this behavioral data, we see sex specific differences in defensive behavior. Males have this increased social dominance, whereas females have this robust attenuation of this evolutionarily conserved acoustic startle response. Noting that I don't see any changes in auditory brainstem responses, um, locomotion, cognition, or other affective behaviors. So this is a very specialized role that DRD2 expression plays. To better understand what, how these sex differences might arise, I went on to look at cell distribution and number, electrophysiological properties, candidate gene expression, and axonal projection patterns. I didn't see any differences in cell distribution and number, but I did see a difference in electrophysiological properties. While resting membrane potential and membrane resistance were similar between male and female, there is an increase in action potential duration in male DRD2 PAT1 neurons. What does this mean? Potentially that it affects calcium influx into the cell and potentially affects neurotransmitter release. Interestingly, looking specifically at these DRD2 conditional knockout cells in males, we see increased levels of GAD2 transcripts. GAD2 is an important uh, step in the synthesis process of making GABA the inhibitory neurotransmitter. And so future directions for this work would be to look at if these neurons could potentially co-release GABA and serotonin, something that to my knowledge has not yet been demonstrated, while we do see co-release of glutamate and serotonin. And so to summarize, I see sex differences in behavior when we conditionally delete DRD2, and a greater percentage of DRD2 conditional knockout cells are GAD2 positive in male cells. Looking at wild type DRD2 PAT1 neurons, I see higher levels of GAD2 transcripts and longer action potential duration in males. I don't have time to go into the axonal projections today, but I'd be happy to talk more with you about that offline. And now coming, about, uh, now coming back to the personal side a little bit. Following uh, this work, I graduated um, here with, I'm sharing a picture with my cats, um, and it was time to decide what to do next. And my career goals are to be a PI, and so I set out to do a postdoc. And this was a difficult decision because I wanted to do important science that I was interested in, but I also found it, that it was very important to me to find a good mentor. 
I'm interested in a lot of different things in science, but I know that I cannot be a good scientist in a bad environment. Also taking into account things like where my family is and a place that I can fit in and feel safe. So I traveled back to the West Coast and joined the lab of Dr. Nicola Allen at the Salk Institute. Here I'm studying astrocytes, which are a type of glial cell that ensheaths the synapse. And I'm really interested in astrocytes because I think they're an underestimated cell type, or at least they have been historically. I think people thought of them just as, you know, they're supporting the neurons, the stars of the show. But astrocytes are very important for synap synaptic plasticity and neuronal network connections. And they also influence behavior, um, including sleep, memory, sensory motor behaviors, feeding, fear, anxiety, attention, and reward. Um, and I recently wrote a review about this with Dr. Allen. And so I hope that in the future I can come back and we can have another one of these meetings and I can tell you more about my postdoc work. And so, hey, hey, thank you very much. I wanna thank Susan Demecki, my advisor. I wanna thank um, my current lab and my funding sources. Um, and I also wanted to mention that sometimes I feel like I'm just a postdoc. What do I know? But I have been through graduate school now. So if anybody um, ever needs help with applying for grant applications or applying for graduate school, please reach out. I'm always happy to help. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing us your PhD work. And we look forward to hearing you talk about your postdoc work next year when we have this in person, I hope. Um, if anyone has any <laughs> questions, yeah. If anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or unmute yourself and So Chrissy, I always ask questions. <laughs> it's it's my my thing. Um, so when you were at Harvard in neuroscience, you were at Harvard Med. Yes. Um, how did that feel? I mean, what was your you know I I wanted I have wanted people who have sort of made it into Harvard from Arizona and New Mexico to somehow write up something about how you develop the ability to survive and not. Feel, not feel like you'd lost yourself? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think one thing for me that was really key was that I was, so I was a tech in that lab, David Ginty's lab that I had worked in as an undergrad and his lab had moved from Hopkins to Harvard. And so when I was applying to graduate school, I applied sort of to like my dream program which I won't say what it was, but I went there and I was like, this is not for me. This is not gonna be a good place for me. Um, and everyone had kind of encouraged me not to stay at Harvard from a growth perspective. I think they were looking out for like, you've been here, now you need to try something new. But for me, I already had a community there and I already had a support system there. And so I stayed there for that because I knew the people that were in that lab that I was a tech in. And I did join a different lab, but, um, I would say like if anybody is experiencing people telling them that they need to change where they are, I, I don't know that you need to follow that advice. I think that you can stay where you are and still have growth. Um, and then the other thing that was really meaningful to me there was that we started a group for underrepresented students in science. Um, and so um, for a long time, I was the only indigenous student in the neuroscience program, but I had my peers, um, that were Latina, that were Black, and we came together and we had community dinners. We gave practice talks. We supported each other throughout things. And so that was critical. Very cool. Well, we'll have a very nice panel discussion later on building supportive communities within academia. So I hope you're, I hope you check that one out because um, it'll be all about making sure we have these supportive communities in indigenous or in academic spaces for indigenous people. And I, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm sure you can definitely relate uh, as being one of the few indigenous people at Harvard. Yeah, definitely.
Well, well we have 15, a 15 minute break right now. Um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time before we start our next little session. Uh, thank you again, Chrissy, for sharing with us your work. And yeah, so we'll take a 15 minute break before we have a uh, two sets of panel discussions. The first one will be on applying to grad school and applying to postdocs, I believe. And you will be using a separate Zoom link to join those discussions, which um, are going to be posted in the chat. Alexa, if you could post that to everyone rather than just post. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Yep, so we'll be back in 15 minutes. Um, you can use the separate Zoom link to join that. Um, yeah, and then after that, we'll have a great panel discussion, like I mentioned, on creating supportive communities and academic spaces. So see y'all at the top of the hour. So for this next section, um, kindly, um, Patrick Naranjo has agreed to be our um, moderator for a really interesting, I think, discussion on Native American mentorship programs. And, and I'm, I'm deeply grateful for Patrick for agreeing to do this and, and also for all the panelists who are, um, you know, our elders and plus Judy, who, who I think of as my elder in, in figuring out how to organize this event. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. You know. It's okay, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Willie and Jesse, for this opportunity. I'm, I'm very excited to moderate such a wonderful cast of individuals. So thank you. Yeah, but um, yeah, so I'll let you take it away, Patrick. Awesome, thank you. So welcome everyone to Building Supportive Communities for Native and Indigenous Scientists in Academia. Uh, my name is Patrick Naranjo. I'm a tribal member from Papo Winge, which is the original name for Santa Clara Pueblo. Uh, I'm also a graduate from Haskell Indian Nations University. Um, I like to mention that because that largely informs uh, my direction as the executive director for the UC Berkeley American Indian Graduate Program. Um, I am not a scientist by trade. I focus more on diversity and inclusion efforts, things like retention and outreach, but I'm so excited to moderate this panel today. Uh, I did wanna begin with a brief land acknowledgement uh, regarding the Berkeley campus. Uh, the American Indian Graduate Program and the Office for Graduate Diversity recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchin, the original landscape of the Chochenyo of speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. The region continues to be of great importance to the Mwekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. Um, like I mentioned, I'm not a scientist, but very excited to introduce our panelists. And I did want to read the bios of, of each of our uh, participants today. And please forgive me if I, if I uh, make any mistakes with this and correct me with uh, with your first question uh, but to start off, start us off i'm uh, very excited to introduce uh, margaret maggie werner washburn um, maggie is a molecular biologist and regents professor emeritus in biology at the university of new mexico she was previously the president of the society of advancement of chicanos hispanics and native americans in science which holds a large multidisciplinary and multicultural STEM diversity conference in the United States, a pioneer of the genomics and the stationary phase of yeast. She is known for her innovative programs to attract and retain underrepresented minorities in STEM. Werner Washburn has made great strides in the field of genetics. She has done gene sequencing with organisms that are disease, disease vectors, which allow for a greater understanding of genetics in general. Um, our next panelist, do we have Dr. Um, Milligan with us today? No, she had to cancel last minute due to a family. I was wondering about that. Okay, okay. Um, our next panelist, uh, you see here, I want to introduce uh, Judith Simcox. 
Uh, she's an assistant professor at the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She is an experienced mentor with a demonstrated history of working in both academic and industrial research. She is a community cultural and academic mentor with the Native American Research Institute, or NARI. And she is a SACNES team member uh, where she's had the privilege of serving at the University of Utah SACNES chapter as the social media coordinator, vice president, and national liaison. Uh, within these positions, she was able to give lectures in Nicaragua on public health, work, and the YWCA ASCEND program to encourage underrepresented minority girls to pursue college, build the first chapter website, lecture at various colleges around the country, and serve on the local community committee for national SACNIS meetings in Salt Lake City. And finally, we have Dr. Pudri. Dr. Pudri is currently a courtesy professor at the University of Oregon, where he participates in the instructions of an ethics course for graduate students. He was a professor of biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he also served in several administrative capacities. As a rotating program director for developmental biology at the National Science Foundation, Pudri developed the minority supplement initiative that was, that was copied widely at NSF and later at, at NIH. He, is, he was the director of the Training Workforce Development and Diversity Division at the National Institute for General Medical Sciences, or NIGMS, NIH, the National Institute of Health, where he was responsible for developing and implementing NIGMS policies and plans for research training programs and capacity building programs that reflect the longstanding commitment to research training and the development of highly capable, diverse biomedical and behavioral research workforce at the National Institute of Health. He developed the Institutional Research and Academic Career Development Award, IRA CDA, which, in which postdocs as a part of mentoring teach at minority serving institutions. He developed a new research initiative designed for the, to understand the efficacy and interventions that thus inform future planning of student development and activities. He also developed the Native American Research Centers for Health program in collaboration with, with Indian Health Service or IHS. I, I was also a former employee of IHS once. Um, as a senior fellow in the science education department at HHMI, he led the Gilman Fellowship Program and an experiment for adoption adaptation of the UMBC Mayor, Mayor Off Program. Dr. Pudri is a native of the Tondawana Seneca Indian Nation in Western New York. He earned both the BA and MI, MA in biology at the State University of New York at Buffalo and received a PhD in biology from Case Western Reserve University. He has served on the advisory boards for both ACES and SACNIS chapters. And so very excited to introduce our wonderful panelists today. Um, I did wanna maybe cover a little bit of initial ground before we get started. Um, very interested in developing some, some uh, dialogue around the lack of indigenous science, scientists within the field and to highlight some of the components of the support networks that help them to feel included within these spaces. Um, if we do have any time at the end of the panel, I would like to open it up for some, some Q&A, uh, if we can coordinate that. Uh, and also, if we could maybe just limit our questions to a, a five minute kind of a response time at max so that everyone has an opportunity to, to share. But thank you so much for this opportunity. and. Um, Maybe just to get started, uh, we can we can begin with question number one. Uh, let me see. I don't know who would like to field this first, but um, how does one develop a program that allows learners to maintain their native identity and indigenous ways of knowing while existing predominantly in Western academia? And I can ask that one more time. How does one develop a program that allows learners to maintain their native identity and indigenous ways of knowing? while existing predominantly in Western academia. Um, anyone would like to take this first, please please jump in. Yeah, I, so <clears throat> I had a big program that I ran and, and it was uh, very successful. It was a pre-PhD program for juniors and seniors. We had a mentoring program and, and I'll be talking about that in my talk later, but I, I recognize that we weren't getting a lot of Native Americans into that program because they weren't thinking about research. And so what I did was to take the mentoring part of this, which was really a long-term 
uh, way to help the students uh, see how strong they were and, and hear their voices uh, in academia. So I took that down for um, freshmen, sophomores, and transfer students, and we targeted Native students. Uh, everybody was welcome, but we called families of Native students and uh, so that about half of the people that were in the in the program were native and and it was really to and i had it in an academic department um, so that they got used to being there and and comfortable in the academic department so it would be in engineering or biology and and uh the things that we talked about and worked on i had a lot of uh, diverse uh, you know native american and hispanic and anglo students who were helping with this program but it was really to get them we talked about things that were universals so that they uh, you know, really got together with all the different kinds of students so that they began to see how to communicate um, broadly. And then part of the program was for them to go back and talk to their relatives and talk to their families and find out more about themselves and their traditions and, and really let them know that this was incredibly important to what they brought to the table. Um, Dr. Poudry? Uh, yes, thanks. Um, you, you know, uh, I, I think one of the things that, uh, that, that I would do if, if I could really frame a, a model is I would say that I uh, should devise something that uh, would, uh, would emulate, would, uh, would copy Maggie Werner Washburn um, in, in, in a couple of different ways. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's a matter of, of behavior. So people that are, are uh, doing it, whether it's, a, whether it's a big program or whether it's a small activity within, a, within an institution, um, one would hope that our, our colleagues that we would try to influence um, would, um, would have and display uh, just some of the behaviors of, of, of Maggie. Um, so, you know, when, when you when you think of people who are curious, who who um, display curiosity, uh, that that's that's catching, and and it, it says, you know, one of the things that the, that we're interested in, the, the, the joy of curiosity, um, but also, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one of the things that the, uh, I think uh, Maggie is a, is a great role model uh, has to do with humility, and. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, and and so you know one of the things that we would want to uh, um, encourage our colleagues is to um, is to accept humility, to to be uh, humble. Just just because we're we're faculty, we're, we're scientists, um, you know, it doesn't mean that uh, um, you know we have uh, any any other special uh, specialties. Um, the other thing is to to embrace kindness um, and. That comes in many ways. So, in in uh, working with students coming in into a program, you know, there there are a lot of opportunities when you just you're just watching, you're paying attention, and and sometimes uh, you know whether whether a person can benefit from uh, from a kind word, a greeting, a smile. Um, these are things that uh, uh, we would like to get our colleagues to to to, to behave that way. I, I don't know of a particular program. That does that. Now we, we have a variety of programs that that have mechanisms, but actually getting our colleagues uh, to do that, I think, is is, is a challenge. Um, the, the final thing, um, uh, again, uh, uh, I, I've seen from Maggie, is to is to see beauty in various places. Uh, to, to me, that's something that students, uh, whether they're already scientists or they're thinking about it, uh, can uh, they can appreciate, and, and that can have an influence on. Them. Uh, finally, um, as uh, as advisors, as mentors, uh, we have to be our strengths and not our challenges. Uh, and and it's it's not always it's not always easy, but uh, uh, we have to be careful not to complain, uh, not not to not to whine about things. Uh, but in fact, um, be the be the kind of, of people that we're uh, hoping that these others will go to be. Thank you for that. And. Dr. Simcox, uh, I wanted to also mention one thing uh, from our conversation or the, the presentation this morning. Uh, I also have family relationships uh, up in Lodge Grass with Greasy Mouth Clan. I'm related to the Walks Over Ice family. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I wanted to mention that. Um, your thoughts on, uh, on uh, 
native identity and indigenous ways of knowing while existing predominantly in Western academia? Yeah, well, nice to meet more family, uh, but okay. So I, I'm following amongst giants here um, in terms of leadership and leadership development. But I, so a lot of what I'm gonna say is just echoing what they've already said. And I think what it boils down to is really value. So the way we measure value and kind of how, how we measure the importance in native communities versus Western communities is very different. And so I feel like what Cliff went through was really a lot of values that we share. We share the value of humility. Um, and I think that comes out in the sense that we value, a, we value community and building community over building individuals, um, which is kind of how things are presented in terms of Western societies. Um, and for a lot of natives coming into science, I think it's really hard because we see the way that science is told to the public almost as very different from how we experience and think about ourselves in the world. Um, science is told as the story of individuals who win Nobel prizes and who are brilliant. And it was only for me when I found that the strength of science is actually in collaborations. It's in the fact that I don't have to know everything, that I can build something with a lot of people and that it's so much more fun to do it that way. And that's how, that's the beauty of science. It's you're, everybody's kind of free to grow into it. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, I think acknowledging that it's okay to measure your own value in different metrics and also to put importance in things like staying close to family, choosing scientific questions that you think are important because we face problems that, that are big. Um, and some of the ways I've seen that implemented are actually in the Native American Research Internship um, we had not just a scientific mentor, but a community cultural mentor. And so students were paired with native elders and scientists. Um, and in fact, actually, it's kind of fun to see some of those uh, Nari mentors here, including Callie Dale. Um, but we paired it and you could go to these advisors and really have fortification of your value systems of humility, of community, of collaboration, and understand that that's just as important and that brings strength to the science. You know, two things that I wanted to mention after that question are from Dr. Pudry's response and yours as well is that, you know, that's right. In order for us to merge the gap between, you know, non-Western and Western forms of academia, we have to incorporate parts of our narrative, right? And one of the things that I really liked was to be humble because that is how we develop support, how we get folks to feel included within these spaces and to be successful within large things like, like science and, and STEM, STEM efforts, right? Thank you so much. Um, next question. And we can, we can start, I guess, with, uh, we'll start in reverse order, I suppose. Um, were you able to find a support network of other natives in science STEM fields that helped you during your journey? Conversely, at moments that you didn't have a support network, how did this affect you? Okay, so if we're going in reverse, I guess I'm going first, is that true? <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, I, I would say that I definitely found a support network, um, both through SACNIS and ACES, uh, especially when I was a grad student and postdoc at the University of Utah and also in mentoring. Um, those systems were not there when I first started in grad school at the University of Utah. And that was actually really hard. Um, in some senses, I say that SACNIS saved me um, because for a long time, I was kind of just pretending um, I was, acting like I like I knew and that I fit in when it was completely, I felt like 
I stuck out so badly and that I didn't know and understand what was going on and that I had nothing to offer. And it was only when I found a group that really where I could take on all of these dynamic roles of being a student, a teacher and a mentor. It was only then when I kind of started succeeding in science. And so I want to say to anybody who's an administrator out there, it's really important for native um, students to kind of find, find that community because otherwise you start losing yourself and you start forgetting where you came from. Um, and that is, I think, why a lot of people leave is because if you don't, if everything feels so unnatural and you feel like nothing fits, it's really hard every day. Um, and what I'm happy to say for the, this now is just to the students um, and the people coming up is that it doesn't have to be like that. Um, I have been, I have been uh, parts of such great communities um, through all different levels of my training and especially now at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where I feel like I have important things to say that people care about me, that I get to serve all of these dynamic roles and it's really fun and I get to bring my whole self to science and I think that's something that hasn't always existed. And I'm really excited to see events like this where you can almost feel like the power um, and just there's something here and it's it's different. Thank you, uh, Dr. Putin. Yeah, I like being in the middle, that way I never have to go first because <clears throat> we'll, we'll switch it around the, the other way. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's a tough question for me because um, um, you know, I'm, I'm a senior citizen and I predate uh, most of the uh, activities. Uh, I had went to university only about uh, 30 miles from home. So in many ways, uh, I wasn't uh, that far from home. <clears throat> but uh, at that university at the time, um, I never met another native in science. I actually never met another native um, in, in college there, even though it was in Western New York with three reservations, right? Uh, uh, not, not far. <clears throat> so. Um, so at my time of, of growing up, um, um, that just <clears throat> that, that just wasn't something uh, to, to be. And, and I was very fortunate. And in some ways, I, I think I was fortunate from the challenges that, the, that, that I had. I have to be thankful for some of them. But I also had uh, a number of kind people um, who um, <clears throat> may or may not have been uh, um, acting you know pro proactively but they were just uh, kind people that uh, um, that that helped me uh, along the way thank you so much and, um, dr Wern. yes here yeah so so i'm in sort of the same boat with cliff so i didn't start out in i mean it, I started as a biology major, then I don't want to tell you how I ended up being an English major, but I did, I, you know, anyway. So I finished in English. And uh, at that point, I had not met, seen a person of color as a faculty member, met another Hispanic in science or anything, um, or a Native American. I mean, it was like, it just wasn't there, you know. Um, and so uh, I'll tell this story when I'm when I gave my talk, but um, I went down to Mexico and it was really uh, Oaxaca that made me a scientist. And then other, you know, I was up in Alaska and, and uh, that also made me a scientist. You know, when I tell, it's so a riot, it's a riot. When I tell like, you know, all these endowed professors how I got into science, sometimes they back up because they just had direct roots. I mean, they just went zoop into it, you know, and I just went like all over the place and, you know, kidnapped and stuff. And it was like, mm. and, but, and I did not meet another person of color as a faculty member until um, I was a year into my job at, at, in New Mexico. And uh, I heard about Sockness. And, uh, it, you know, it just, it saved my life. I mean, and that, and we have a Southwest Hispanic Research Institute that's mostly humanities, but they felt sorry for me. So they took me in. And so I had these communities and, but yeah, it's, I think about Judy, you know, at Wisconsin. 
I never would have considered a job at Wisconsin at the time that I was there. Robin Kimmerer and I were grad students together. At that time, she did not really own her it, her indigenousness. And, and so we, we would never have talked about it. She didn't know who I was. And I mean, and we knew each other, but we never would have talked about me being Hispanic or her being indigenous because if we had done it, everybody would just make fun of us. So it was, uh, you know, it was a different time. You know, thank you for your response. You, your leadership is how we develop, you know, these efforts in the field. And one of the things I like to spend around a lot of time around, you know, through my native perspective is an intersectional approach for a contemporary native identity, right? And I say this because a lot of the criteria that largely informs how native people feel about identification is kind of kind of confusing. And the other aspect is that when we look at things through this intersectional lens, a majority of individuals like ourselves come from first generation college families, or we have multiple identities that make us feel further not included within these spaces. And you know, thank you for your mentorship because this really represents how we further indigenize and develop the academy for, for better growth. Um, next question, and we will begin with Dr. Boudry. Um, related to the above, how did you locate your community? What was the most interest and support in reflection? And what would have better equipped this network? Um, I don't know what would better equip the, uh, the, the network. Um, and as far as uh, finding community, um, you know, I, I, I would say that, uh, you know, all along um, the, the, the ones and twos that, the, that I met, um, we, 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 there was a, uh, we struck a chord and, um, and, and would sometimes just, uh, just want to do things to, together. And so uh, opportunities came up um, over the years where uh, there, there was an opportunity to serve. And, and I'll admit that there's a pull. Um, there, there, there is a pull to, to, to be able to contribute to, to, to serve. And um, I, you know, I, 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 it's a pretty tough question where, where I found the community. It, it just uh, um, it took, took a lot of years. And, uh, and of course, uh, ACES and SACNIS were two important uh, um, uh, groups uh, along the way as well. Dr. Warner? Well, you know, uh, so again, uh, before I got to UNM, uh, I'm gonna talk about my little walkabout, but I, I went all over the Americas and to New Zealand and Western Samoa and Hawaii. And, and uh, I had been accepted by, it was incredible to me, or, or, or people thought I was part of, of 25 different indigenous groups from Alaska to Ecuador and Venezuela. And, you know, so I had that um, as, as, you know, being here. And, and New Mexico is such an incredible place to be. I mean, we have all our Pueblos and Navajos and everybody. So I just, I'm, I'm happy as a clam here. Um, but, and it was Sockness really, so because I would say the, the colleagues are the biggest point that Cliff made. Um, it's very, it was very difficult for, for me, you know, because the way I look, people didn't think I was, and I identified as Hispanic, people didn't believe me. And, and so they would like, you know, it was a difficult, a difficult thing. So Sockness, I would go every year and it was like this blood transfusion. It was like being in a place where I didn't have to have my armor up for however long the meeting was. And you could just feel uh, regenerated from that sort of thing. And um, so anyway, that was it. I, you know, I, I'm the last of six kids. So I'm like always trying to bring family together. And uh, so that's, I kind of do that too. Thank you so much. This is a wonderful discussion, Dr. Simcox. Yeah. Um... I'll tell, I guess, two, two big stories. Um, so I think one, um, I had a really phenomenal graduate mentor. Um, his name's Don McLean, but I was really struggling. And I told him that I was struggling with a sense of belonging um, and I was struggling to find my place. And he helped me find the resources. But not only did he help me find the resources, he taught me how to find them myself in the future. Um, and then he also taught me how to 
build programs and write grants uh, to support Native communities. Um, and so he was part of writing the first grant for the Native American Research Internship and really leading that and identifying the key individuals for it. And I think that one of the things he taught me was he let me write different sections. Um, and so I think kind of having, finding people who, and some of these people are here in this room actually, I think of Cliff and Maggie as these types of builders um, and finding the builders. And I also, I see builders in Willow and Robbie and a lot of other, and Jesse and a lot of uh, the natives who helped organize this. Um, you start seeing them because they shine a little bit um, and just just trust uh, kind of your natural gravity to them, but identify the builders, they'll help you build things and they'll help you develop the tools that you need to find your community. Um, I think the other thing though, is exactly what Cliff and Maggie said that these communities like Sackness, Aces, they are so fundamental um, in finding people. And I think just being an authentic version of yourself. Um, I think I, I used to, feel like I had to hide that I came from like a tiny town of less than 500 people or that I didn't know a lot of things that other people knew. Um, and now I see it as a strength because the way I perceive the world is really different. And I think that's probably the most important thing I bring to science. Um, and so I, I think that's the final piece is again, back to this concept of value. Um, you find your community by valuing yourself and realizing that value in others. Um, and it becomes really obvious when you see the people who are guided by building something bigger than themselves and you'll find them. And then you'll find those communities that are, that are about changing the world. You know, one of the efforts that I really liked that, that came out in this conversation is the idea of, of mentorship and being humbling, you know, and, we like to use big words like inclusion or, you know, so forth, but a big part of, of making the, these connections is highlighting a little bit of your experience and how that relates to, you know, informing the academy. And so, you know, I, I like to tell folks things about myself, like I, I vote just like you, I, I have a favorite sports team, I listen to hip hop music, things that help resonate with, with the professional side of these conversations, and because they really become important, they sure do. Um, next question, and I guess we can begin with, uh, with Dr. Werner. <laughs> um, what are some of the unique needs Native trainees have? Uh, how can we better support these efforts within these spaces? Well, I think this kind of meeting is one of the ways to do it. I think, you know, it's, this is a start and I'm just, I, you know, so grateful to Willow and Judy and whoever else was involved in getting this set up, Robbie, and um, because it's really important. You can, the students can feel incredibly isolated and be isolated. And then you've got faculty uh, who, you know, have different relationships with Native Americans. I mean, some of them like Native Americans are so precious, you know, or it's like, ooh, <laughs> you know, like not real human beings. Like I can't really talk to, you know, or we, and it goes to the other side, like I treat everybody the same. And so like just walk in and walk out, you know? Um, and so it's really important to find, um, you know, these sorts of, of, of gatherings, you know, together for, for, for doing this. Um, I would say my, so some of my students, you know, would come from um, a lot of little towns. I looked for kids that came from little towns because I will tell you the gift that they have is that they've seen the stars at night and they know the Milky Way and they've sat once in a while and go, how small am I? You know, I mean, they think about this stuff. And so it was very easy to flip them into this imaginative area of science, which is really important. Um, I think uh, being intimidated by by things and and oh I know they would come in not knowing the right majors you know because their grandmother said something or somebody said something and I would tell them well what do you love and it was like what do I love what's that and so we would work on that a lot and then when they found it out the families got happy they got happy and you know now they're lawyers and farmdies and scientists and everything. <laughs> That's right, that's what gets us to, to do the things that we never thought we could do within these spaces. Um, Dr. Poudry? 
the, there, there was a, um, a number of years at, the, at, at Santa Cruz where we didn't have many, you know, that many natives on, on campus. But for, uh, for a time period, uh, if there were natives and if they were in the sciences, um, they, would, they, they would come by my office, they would come by, by my lab. Um, and, and so uh, if, if we had native students who were gonna be working in research labs, uh, uh, quite often I'd, I'd find that you know, we, 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 we make a connection. And, uh, and sometimes uh, uh, one particular example, uh, Scotty Henderson um, had no particular interest in, uh, in fruit fly genetics. Um, she was she was interested in, in marine sciences. Uh, I think she would really love to be studying whales. But um, she was she was one who, who came around to, to the office and, uh, and we chatted and um, introduced her to, to other people. Uh, she ended up doing uh, doing a thesis in in, in my uh, in my lab. Um, and 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 it wasn't just it wasn't just me. It was it was in fact the group. Uh, the group was was welcoming and uh, and I think she. Um, she was a little bit more comfortable there, perhaps, than um, than with the group that was uh, out uh, out studying whales. Um, how that happens, um, you know, I, I'm not sure um, because it, it, it's not one person, um, but uh, but but hopefully one person can infect um, uh, those those around, and and uh, particularly if uh, if you're a leader there, you, you can you can set the standard, and your behavior then becomes the uh, behavior of other people. Like it, it also raises the awareness of our colleagues in these fields. You know, we, we become students and then we, we work in these spaces. Dr. Sukhans. Yeah, um, so I'm gonna, I guess, call out one of my students who spoke, uh, Lori, because I think her journey highlights a lot of the things that Native students need to be successful. And so a lot of what I'm just gonna do is highlight parts that she spoke of. Um, so. Lori talked about getting her associate's degree. Um, and I think that is exceptionally important is if needed the opportunity for bridge programs that, um, and I think Maggie has a long history of building these because native students are incredibly bright, intelligent and creative, but a lot of us come from rural communities which do not have the same resources as as everybody else. Um, and so I think bridge programs are such a great way to build the strengths of students. Um, for a lot of native students, I think it is important to acknowledge that sometimes being close to family is the most important thing. And that is how I chose to go to grad school at the University of Utah. It was the closest graduate school to my family where I, it's like an eight hour drive um, from my hometown. And so, if there was an emergency, I could hop in my car and drive, drive through the night. Um, I think it's also important um, through several stories, uh, not just Lori's, but also uh, Cliff and Maggie mentioned this, native mentors are extremely important because I think of this in terms of what native mentors like actually uh, in the attendees is Corey Welsh, uh, who is also from Montana, but He's Cheyenne, so we know he's not as good as the crows, um, but he was still a major mentor to me. <laughs> and um, I think what Native mentors realize is sometimes Native students ask for things in different ways. Um, we don't often complain because we know that good words are important and that our words have impacts in the world around us. And so sometimes it's hard to ask for help or to say something's not right. And I think really good native mentors can kind of feel uh, when, when students need help and when they need something uh, bigger. And the final thing I wanna mention that Lori emphasized is a community house. Um, things like gathering to cook, gathering to share meals, gathering to study, having a just a place that everybody gathers. I mean, it's just like, that was the thing I missed most about being away from Montana was we all gathered on, on Sundays at my grandma's house and there'd be like 50 people there. And you miss that, like you miss that sense of instant family. Um, and so I would say those are the pillars of really what I needed and what a lot of students need. Thank you. I will, I will mention we're at the five minute mark um, and maybe just to briefly close within this, how do we foster connections uh, between 
non-scientific Native communities and Native scientists to, to develop this awareness. Um, any takers? <laughs> Well, so let me just say that uh, since I retired from UNM, what I've been doing is uh, a lot of the students went away to fancy schools like yours for graduate programs. And, uh, and, and then I found out they wanted to come home, right? Because everybody wants to be with their families. And, and so I had to go out and meet all the businesses in town. Uh, and so I started this thing we call STEM Boomerang or Boomerang New Mexico. And, and I have a, a young woman taking it over for me now. But um, it was really a way to make these warm handshakes between people to, to help you know uh, indigenous people from New Mexico who have gone off and gotten degrees, they often don't know how to build, how to write a resume, for example. So that's easy. I love, I love helping with resumes, um, but then trying to get them back in. And, and then, you know, hopefully getting to a point where we can start educating the companies about how important all these guys are. I mean, uh, the, but that's what I do anyway, is to, is to try to help people get jobs. Cause if, because if they've gone off to Washington or Stanford or Berkeley or Harvard or wherever and gotten their PhDs and or or masters or even bachelor's degrees, you can get incredible jobs here that lift the socioeconomic status of the whole family. So it's you know that and plus their home and you know it's just important. So that's what I do. Dr. Dr. Pudry. So. Um... Uh, I, I look. I look among the colleagues. Of course, I, I'm retired now, so I don't have as, as many immediate colleagues. But I look among uh, colleagues who are people that, uh, that that might be allies in in one way or another. Um, and so here at the University of Oregon, one of the faculty members, uh, Chris Doe, uh, had had mentioned um, ha having had uh, you know, native uh, um, uh, through the lab, and and he he would like to find ways to reach out to do more. Um, that conversation led to, you know, uh, another conversation, and um, and we made some connections other places. And um, whether or not it will lead to a program, I don't know. But uh, um, have have an ally there that's uh, that's interested in learning more and and reaching out and um, and and other, uh, you know, so ones and twos here um, start uh, start making friends. And somewhere in the conversation, you might uh, find that interest that uh, um, that that we can can leverage and um, um, and start you know start building, doing doing some things together. Uh, and I think the the uh, the togetherness is uh, is really important. Uh, each one of us doesn't have to go off and, and solve all the problems of the world. And and, and as Judith said, you know the, um, the 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 collaborative nature uh, of our business uh, um, is. Uh, is in some ways a reward in itself, whether it's um, in, in the science or in developing uh, support structures for students. Um, you know, finding, finding allies, um, sometimes just through casual conversation over lunch or after a seminar or something like that, uh, those are things that, uh, that we build on. And, and Dr. Um, Simcox. All right, that's the perfect intro for, to bring this home. Um, so I talked a lot about how I had a really great graduate mentor who, I mean, he's built, I think like three diabetes centers now. Um, and he helped write the first grants for the Native American Research Internship. And when he was teaching me about how to become a mentor, um, he had such great lessons. And I'm gonna share some of the advice that he had for building programs. Um, and I think it reflects a lot of what Maggie and Cliff said. Um, so he said, you know, organizations need, it's not just the strongest players, we need specific players. And he said that we need a mascot, um, somebody to that everybody will rally around. Um, we need somebody who is really good with money and in the concept of NARI that meant uh, writing money for grants. Um, he said that we need a strong leader um, somebody who will bring people together, which is a little bit different than a mascot. A mascot's like the front uh, face of an organization. A leader is somebody who almost works behind the scenes to remove barriers um, and help people be the strongest in their individual roles. He also said we need organizers, um, somebody who really handles the small details. 
And the final thing he said, and he said this was the most important, was that we need a leader of the heart, somebody who brings in the right, the right sense of listening and the right sense of empathy and ability to really listen to people and see them. Um, and those are really hard things, but I think if you look for those when you're building um, organizations that you have the ability, as Cliff said, to identify the allies and build things that are bigger than yourself. I believe we're, we're out of time. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful discussion. You know, as a, as a former student, native person, I, I learned a lot today and I wanna thank each one of you for this opportunity. Um, and that concludes uh, our event today. Thank you so much for this. I, I will say that if anyone has anything else they want to say, we, we can always be flexible time. I'm supposed to say something for 15 minutes as closing statements, and I definitely don't have 15 minutes worth of closing statements. So, um, and I apologize for my lighting, everyone. We have a, a timed light in the front that keeps going off, so my apologies for that. You're, you're good. You're good. Um, so if anyone wants to say anything else or if you have something else you'd love to ask them or anyone in the chat wants to ask anything, I, I, I would encourage that space. Um, but if not, we can also move on to wonderful Maggie's talk. <laughs> I thought maybe my talk was next. <laughs> we have um, one raised hand. The raised hand, it looks like, was Corey. Put your hand down, Corey. <laughs> There's the light. I'm not sure if we can, I don't know how to unmute the, the speakers or the attendees. So, so maybe Corey, can you just ask your question in the chat or something? Oh, it says talking permitted for Corey. So I think he just has to unmute himself. Oh, okay. I was just gonna you know, be a smart aleck and you know, this vicious attack by the Crow tribe, you know, tribe nation towards <laughs> Northern Cheyenne brethren. I mean, come on. <laughs> Supposed to lift each other up here, Dr. Simcox, how dare you? I'm I kidding, said you course. were an important mentor. <laughs> <laughs> you did. I know you should probably take that back. No, I just want to thank all of you. Um, and i um, proud to say as someone who's uh, a lot of his career was funded by programs that Cliff Poudry established and Maggie and Cliff were among the first natives I ever met with a PhD at a softness conference. And that was really um, that infusion that Maggie talked about was really powerful because I didn't gonna have, I was never gonna have a native community in my graduate science programs. So I had to find it elsewhere. And that was one of the great places for it. So thank you all, I'll stop talking. Um, wonderful, thank you, Corey, for that. We do have one question in the Q&A, which is how can non-native students increase and advocate for inclusion of indigenous peers? I guess the one thing that I would always say about this, and I know I keep hitting on the sense of value, um, but really listen when somebody's speaking. And um, again, uh, Angela Byers Winston always says this, and she I love it because it's so true, but she always says, we're gonna take it from the headspace and bring it to the heart place. Um, and so I think listening actively with your heart is, really important and I know that sounds really cheesy but I think that that is what when you're struggling with a sense of belonging when it's hard because you don't know how to necessarily communicate things because even things like humor and um, it took me a long time uh, uh, to really understand how to ask for things and and uh, really ask for what I needed. And I think that what I've been really lucky with is having peers and mentors who kind of amplified my voice. And when I said something was important, they would tell people to listen. And they taught me how to listen to myself and how to identify what I needed. And so I, I again, I, I think it sounds cheesy, but really just being an advocate and a listener. Yeah, I think that I think the idea of reciprocity relationship, you know, um, 
uh, responsibility. I mean, there's, uh, this mentoring thing, it goes both ways. I mean, I learn as much from my students as I'm sure they learn from me. And, um, you know, I think that for non-native students, um, the, the win is enormous to, you know, to really figure out how to be friends and how to, because you'll learn, you learn so much. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, my, my relatives from um, Santa Domingo from Kiwa Pueblo come and I'm like, I just, can't, you know, I just, I love to hear them talk. I just love to be at the table. And, you know, so it's, um, you know, it's a win. I mean, <laughs> But it's got to be with respect to, I think, four R's, you know, responsibility, uh, reciprocity, relationship, and respect. That's the mottos, I think. If there's any other questions, I'd love please feel free to ask. Thank you so much. This was awesome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I can't share my video because my video has been stopped. So, but um, I don't know why it says I'm not allowed to, but that's fine. Um, but I, I just really appreciate Patrick, you, you hosting this space. I, I think it was really wonderful to have you. Um, and it's okay if you're not a scientist. In fact, it's great if you're not a scientist. We have enough scientists here. So, you know, <laughs> the other things too. So. Um, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate this. Yeah. Uh, and we were supposed to have a break. I didn't realize that. And I made a mistake saying that Maggie was next. But at the same time, I think we have a good momentum here. So we can either take a couple minute break if we want, um, or we can get started. Um, Maggie, what do you want to do? I don't care. What does everybody want to do? Take a couple minute break. Take two. Take, yeah, let's, let's start it uh, in like uh, four minutes. <laughs> I, I have to go refill my HHMI cup. Yes, what, that's right. Everybody <laughs> fill your cup, fill your cup, sit down. And uh, we'll just we'll just uh, start talking here. So let's take a break. We can you 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 declared Maggie four minutes, and I think it's been four minutes now. So um, um, it's it's um, with great pleasure that I can introduce Maggie. I think we've all gotten to know her over the course of the day from all of her questions. And no, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And and the fact that you know she helped discover the heat shot protein system, as as we heard. She declared um, earlier, which is absolutely true and well deserved. And Maggie, if, if, if you don't know, has won an absurd number of awards, which I um, won't even try to recount, but um, due to her an amazing work in mentorship and, um, and, and just as an amazing human. Um, so I, and I have really enjoyed um, in general, when I've been organizing this event, it's been really nice to reach out to people and get to know so many people. And one of the people I've really enjoyed interacting with is Maggie. She's been super sweet and, and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just super grateful to our interaction. We had a wonderful conversation yesterday for a while and she's been, um, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful. And um, with that, I will let you take it away and talk, um, teach us. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. You know, I'm, I can't believe how honored I am to have been invited to this. So I, I really, I thank you tremendously. And uh, I greet you from Albuquerque, the traditional homelands of the Tiwa people of the Pueblo of Sandia and their name for this area, uh, <clears throat> previous to it being called Albuquerque is Tufshortia or Green Reed Place. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo and then Navajo and Apache, all have deep connections to the land and they all have made significant contributions to our knowledge, to our lives and our traditions. And I honor these people who live with the earth and have remained responsible to their relationships with the land, plants and animals for millennia. So before I really start, I also want to greet you in the way that I was greeted when I was in New Zealand and invited to go to a Maori Marae. The greeters came to see us and they were crying because they recognized all our ancestors 
and that we were the physical embodiment of all these people who'd gone before us. So I want to recognize all of our ancestors here and many who didn't even know that those of us who are here in the physical presence would even exist, but who gave every generation and their generation the energy and the knowledge and the protection to exist and thrive. And then, you know, I, I love braiding sweetgrass. I, I, I really need to have a, another conversation with Robin Kimmerer, but um, she has this great line at the end that says, I accept full responsibility for the unknowing errors that I will undoubtedly make from my own ignorance. <laughs> so the title of this talk is Seeing Double, Reconciling Science and Tradition. And basically what I'm going to do is talk about seeing double because I've seen double all my life and then how I was called to be a scientist and a little tiny bit about imagination and tradition. And then what I want to do is share with you these principles that we used in my program that I hope help you. Um, so many of you seem, um, you know, really confident, but uh, I find these principles are, are important and they keep me going and I'll tell you more about them. And one of the things that you'll hear during the talk is this um, convergence idea. Um, so let me, I'll, tell you in, I'll tell you in a minute more. <laughs> so this is Dancing Dougie Hall. And I grew up with Rodeo and he's a 28 year old Blackfeet, sorry to other tribes in Montana, um, a Blackfeet. <laughs> <laughs> saddle bronc rider who went through a real serious thing and but he speaks well and so he, over the last year or so he's he give, makes these short little videos uh with life lessons and they're wonderful so in august he was talking about a calf roper he knew that um was blind in one eye and that she was really an amazingly great calf roper and he admired her and <clears throat> a woman wrote a comment right after that and said, you know, my son is cross-eyed and well, you know, uh, he sees double and uh, uh, people like that are just incapable, you know, they, they really can't do much and uh, they can't even catch a ball, but he wants to be a calf roper. Do you think he can do it? And uh, so I wrote a comment and I said, you know, I, I was cross-eyed and had surgery and I see double and I will say I can't play tennis, but I never had trouble on horses. So I think he can do really well. Um, and, and she was happy, but it started me thinking about my eyes because I hadn't really thought about it, you know, because I've just seen double all my life. And um, so here's a picture of me as a little girl on my rocking horse, Go-Go here. And I'll, I'll make it a little closer so you can see what, what people were dealing with with me. And, uh, but to me, seeing double always was an ability, not a disability. And my husband jokes, uh, we have two children, and my husband jokes that I think we have four sons. So uh, people coming to my office, that was funny. They would come into my office and if they hadn't seen me before, they would always like look behind to see who it was I was looking at. Sometimes when I taught, I could ask a question and I would get it one answer on one side of the room and another answer on the other side of the room. But because I saw one thing with one eye and something slightly different with the other eye, at an early age, I began to wonder if everybody saw the same world. And, and not, I don't have any depth perception. And, uh, and it causes me to really pay attention to where I'm walking into the earth and my world is flat, right? So it's all two dimensional. It's not, you know, but, but I really uh, operate on the basis of shadows and things that move faster or slower, depending on how far away they are. But if there aren't good shadows, I can fall. I saw 3D once it was, I would think I was six or seven and in the ophthalmologist's office. And it was like, you know, this or this, you know, with the glass and, and, and I saw I saw 3D and it was just for a second and it was a pipe. <laughs> I'm glad it was a simple object, but it was a pipe. And I felt it with my eyes. I, I just couldn't believe it. But you know, I thought that um, uh, it, was, it was overwhelming really. I, and I never really wanted to do that again because I can only imagine that 
seeing in three dimensions must be a, an enormous distraction in your life that you, you just go around, you just like feel trees and feel things with your eyes. Um, the other thing about being uh, this, having this thing is that um, when, when I was in Central America, the Mayans, uh, nowadays they say it's because the sun god has crossed eyes, but um, back then when I was living there, they told me that it was, uh, they, they tried to make their children see like this. So they would hang a ball out in front of a baby so that their eyes would cross. And they told me that it was because you would have one eye on earth and one eye on God. And I kind of like that thing. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think these eyes have been really important for my imagination and for many other aspects of my life, but but there's a lot I still don't understand. Um, but whatever it is, you know, my world has been a little different and I intuitively come at things from a different direction and I have experienced things that I can't explain. So after I figured out the title of this thing, I was talking to a colleague who used to be a former student, Rinalda Sosi, and I was telling her about talking about seeing double. And she goes, well, do you know Albert Marshall? And I was like, no. And so he has been talking for 25 years. He's Micmac and talking for 25 years about two-eyed seeing, where one eye is seeing the world and science and the Western world, and one eye is seeing tradition and trying to figure out how to bring those two things together. So um, that was a convergence. I had no idea that he had been doing that. So I wanna tell you, I'll, I can't tell you my whole journey because it's really long. I'm, you know, I've lived a long life, but the picture at the top is uh, my mother's family from Mexico. And uh, they left Mexico during the Mexican revolution. Pancho Villa and Zapata were coming to their town and it got, very dangerous and my grandfather was a miner and um, British sent a train to pick up everybody. And so they left with just the clothes on their backs and a picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And they had to go around Mexico uh, on the train because the, there were you know uh, fights everywhere. And when they got to New Orleans, my grandmother Concha put her arms around the kids and she said, you know, Losing everything was the best thing that ever happened to us. Now we know what can't be taken away. It's our education, our family, and our faith. Thank God for nothing. So thank God for nothing was really uh, our family motto for many generations, or has been. And uh, they moved to Iowa. My grandfather had, had family there, and that's where I grew up. It was a little town on the Mississippi. And I spent a lot of time on horseback and, uh, um, you know, went to did musicals and things like that. And when I was getting ready to go to college, I didn't know where to go. And uh, the, the car dealership had a magazine and it, it had pictures of Stanford and they called it the farm. And so I thought, well, I'll go there because I know farms. And then it turned out that my grandparents cook in Mexico had once worked for Leland Stanford. So I thought we had family connections. And of course that wasn't true. And, and really I would say Stanford was really difficult for me. I, it was difficult because I, I didn't fit anywhere. And um, you know, uh, it's a long story. But uh, I started in biology and I switched to, um, I switched to chemistry or switch to, uh, switch to English. All right, I'll tell you what happened. Um, it was freshman year and my dad had just died and um, I got a C in a chemistry test. That was the first C I'd gotten. And uh, I went to the professor and he told me, well, um, you know, I don't know how important academics is. Maybe it's not important at all. Maybe what you ought to do is quit school and get married and go cook for your husband. And I found myself in the library just crying and I pulled down a book and, and if you, I have all my relatives are always with me. And so I figured it was my grandmother telling me what to do. <laughs> it was a book of poetry. So I became an English major. My last class was about Pablo Neruda and it just opened my world to um, Latin America. And, and so I thought, well, I'll go to Mexico and see where my mother's from. And, and, uh, and so I did, I had $300 and I took off to Mexico. And the minute I hit Mexico, I was home. I mean, it was uh, Benga Chica, you know, I was like, you know, it was 
I knew how people made their decisions and it was, it was fantastic. Um, I then went from Mexico because I was trying to meet Pablo Neruda. So I went down to Colombia and down on the lower left are uh, some friends of mine from this little town I lived in in Colombia. And, um, you know, from there I went to Alaska, which I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, the picture on the lower right is, um, is a picture of me in Hawaii where I got my master's degree. And uh, it was... Um, you know, I had a great trip. And then I went to Wisconsin for my PhD and postdoc and then back to UNM. Now, what I'm gonna show you, so this is my walkabout. After I finished my undergraduate, I felt like I was spit out of Stanford like a watermelon seed, you know? And I just, I kept going. And um, what happened is that I just met all these amazing people and, lots of indigenous groups. I lived with Quiche Maya in, in Guatemala and, uh, you know, ran into all these different tribes down in Venezuela and on the Amazon and lived in New Zealand and <laughs> Western Samoa and Hawaii and Alaska. So it was amazing. Um, and so I was very happy to come to New Mexico. Um, and, but I will tell you that uh, in this trip, uh, was how I became a scientist. And I'm gonna tell you next about the events that did that. But what I wanna say is I had made this trip and when I was at UNM about 10 years ago and Kayla will probably jump at me for showing this, but about 10 years ago, you know, I had my DNA analyzed, but I did it. My grandmother said, always told us we were Spanish, you know, and I think everybody's Hispanics are all finding this out. And, and so when I got my information back, and this is, just a, I, this is just the distribution of my mitochondrial DNA. And what, I don't know, I, I almost burst into tears. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that I, this clear this walkabout was meant to be for me. And I was, you know, so I would say to you, there's a lot about my life that I don't understand. Now I wanna tell you the events that led me to be a scientist and it was not a program, it was not high school, it was not that anybody recognized me to be a scientist and I again was an English major. So the first thing that happened was I went to Mexico City and I saw Coatlicue and she's the mother of Quetzalcoatl and many other gods and I spent hours in front of her trying to understand how someone could look at this as a mother figure. And it, it sort of deconvoluted my thinking or something because then my brain was open to a whole bunch of things. And when I got to Oaxaca and there's Mixtex and Toltex and, and it, this is a Wipil or a shirt from women in Tehuantepec. Tehuantepec is a matriarchy. And, but I thought purple, how in the world do they have purple? That's the color of the queen's outfits. You know, purple's the royal color. Turns out that the men in Tehuantepec had figured out you could take cotton fibers down into the ocean, agitate mollusks. They gave off this purple dye and the salt water acted as a mordant. And all of a sudden my brain just exploded and I realized that I had not ever thought about the coevolution of people and plants. And that these people that I was talking to, uh, you know, had fed and clothed and healed themselves with things that were all around them. And so this unreal relationship just, I, I just, that was when I sort of really began to be a scientist and I went and talked to every curandera and brujo I could talk to while I was down there. Then I went to Alaska and between February and July, we were out in the bush five river days from the nearest town and we ran out of supplies by accident. Another big long story, I'll tell you when we're all hanging out together. But um, I had let, read a lot of ethnobotanical books. And so I, I, you know, again, all that from Alaskan indigenous perspectives. So thank God to save my life because I would go out and hunt and gather during the day. And if I didn't get anything, the guys would go out at night. And this is me cooking something that, that we'd gotten. But one day I was out by myself and, and walk, you know, uh, tapping birch trees and all that and getting marsh marigolds and things. This is, this is from my journal, the picture of the marsh marigold. And um, 
all of a sudden I had this like blinding flash that if it weren't for the evolution of photosynthesis, that nothing that we knew would even exist uh, other than sludge on rocks. I mean, no moose, no trees, no, you know, not, I mean, it's like not really amazing. And it sort of, it tied me to studying plants. It, it, I can't even tell you, it was like a weld, you know, that I had to do it. And the, the last thing I just want to mention is that uh, when I was growing up, um, I was the last of six kids and my mom uh, was really the place where any kid went who didn't have any other place to go in my hometown. So we had uh, 28 foster brothers and sisters, but there were the Delgados were close for most of my life. And Bobby Delgado was really special. And when I was at college, um, he got his GED and he got what he thought was a really great job spray painting the insides of boxcars. And mom calls and she said, Bobby died. And he was in his early 20s and had two kids and, uh, and uh, turned out his liver was the same color as the paint he was spraying. They didn't give him any um, protective devices. And so, you know, my goal at UNM was to always make places where people were safe working and to always help, you know, in areas where I thought there might be, you know, toxic waste and things like that. So it's, you know, we're, we're driven by these things. And, and so really my drive to science had nothing to do with um, anything classical. <laughs> so what I found was that I always had intersecting but non-identical worlds with with most faculty. And in fact, sometimes the guys that, you know, my friends that are Nobel laureates and stuff, they it, it kind of scare, I don't tell them about my life because it, it scares them, you know, they, they can't handle it. So I would just want to spend a minute on imagination or the permission to dream. Um, so imagination has always been important to me. And I, it was how I survived hitchhiking down through Mexico and South America, believe me, and again, I'd love to hang out with you and I'll tell you some stories. <laughs> it was what I saw in my grandmother's stories. You know, we would like think about Mexico and dream. And it was always what I saw when I closed my eyes. But when I taught um, genomics like 15 years ago, uh, I realized that my students weren't using their imaginations to learn science. And, um, I basically, so that I basically would start my molecular biology classes by saying, look, you know, some scientists think science is everything, but for me, scientists, science is in this little box of things that we can weigh and measure. And we have all this other stuff. And that's where all my relatives live. And I actually don't want science to go there. But, you know, you have to understand that, that when I'm doing the scientific method, you know, that doesn't impact it so much, but it does impact the questions that I ask and what is valuable to me to ask. But anyway, when I found out my students couldn't use their imaginations and um, it was a little scary, I spent a year trying to figure this out, but, but what we would do is close our eyes and in our department, uh, imagine in our imaginations, walk to a restaurant that was close to school. And then we would, um, you know, what, what, what do you feel on your feet? You know, how do you know you're out in the hall? What does the door feel like? Um, how do you know you're outside? What do you hear? What do you smell? You know, all these things. So we just really make them aware of their senses in this imagination journey. And then when we get to the end, we say, well, look, you didn't memorize that. You learned it in your bones. And so we would then go, go into a cell, become 10 nanometers and, and, and do all sorts of things. And again, I would love to um, just spend a whole time doing that because it's, it's a really amazing fun and it's a superpower to be able to do that. Um, okay, so, oh, I know. So here, let's see, am I gonna get this? Yeah, okay. So then in terms of, um, you know, coming together here, uh, I've been listening more to Greg Cajete who's also from Santa Clara and, um, he says, everything in nature is alive with energy, becoming open to the natural world with all of one's senses, body, mind, and spirit is the goal of native science. So that's it. It's really paying attention because if, if you don't pay attention and take the time, you know, you can't have a 
reciprocal relationship, you know, uh, worms and yeast and everything, you know, they, they live a, sometimes a little slower than we do, sometimes a little faster, but you've just got to um, be with them in order to like take on what they're going to teach you and, and hopefully ask them brilliant questions. And what Albert Marshall says that imagining or imagination is very important. And for this, we need two-eyed seeing. So it's like, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, so then I had my program. And this is Crystal Charlie, who's on, who's, who's watching and uh, who I dearly love. And uh, I, I had to ask myself, well, you know, I have all these incredible students that I, that I care so much about. What can I give them? that would help them have the tools they need to survive. It's not that there, there's a, I don't have a deficit model for these guys at all, but you know, ha, what tools are they gonna need to be able to survive out in the Western science world? And so I came up with these four principles and I will say that I did choose four principles because uh, of the enormous Native American presence ambience here in New Mexico, you know, Catholics, I grew up Catholic, um, we think in threes, uh, and but fours were really important. And uh, again, there's, there are, there are other traditions like uh, Diné College has uh, four principles, four, four directions for uh, doing an activity. And I just last week talked to a person in Molokai who they have a program that has four principles that is about a journey, making a journey. And it's, it's something you can hang on to. And, you know, almost like when you're, whatever set of, of pillars works for you, it's like, I think being inside your sacred mountains, you know, it's, it protects you from things. And these principles have ended up being uh, very useful not only it personally to kind of go through it yourself, but they also help to form community because they're universals. And I never have heard when we've talked about these things that, well, we can't talk about that in my culture. So it's, it's been, they've been real blessings to all of us. So this is a picture of, of some doorways at Chaco, which if you haven't been to Chaco, you should go. But the first principle is know your heart. And many students that I had uh, were in majors for no real reason that, that you know, it was a, their grandmother said something or somebody said something. And, and really I thought, what was the most important gift I could give to a young person? What, what really brought my life into focus, you know? And, and it was really giving permission and encouragement to know what it is that they loved, to know how to listen to their heart and to understand how to align their path with their values and what they cared about. And I know this can sound gushy to some people, but when you know it, when you're there, um, it's almost like what Eastern traditions describe as the Tao. It's like being on this path, this, you know, this green path that Robin Kimmerer talks about. So I remembered in my own life how lost I'd been for four years as an undergraduate. And I lived with the imposter syndrome. My self-esteem was as low as it could go. And it really wasn't until Oaxaca <laughs> that I knew uh, what I wanted to do. And it took me years to get into school after that. It wasn't like an instant, you know, turning the ship. But by that time, I felt confident and really unafraid. And so all the macroaggressions that I had experienced at Stanford, I still, had, I still ran into those same things when I went back to school, but they bounced off of me like bullets off of Superman because I was just, I, you couldn't teach me enough. I mean, I scared physics professors because I was, they had big classes and weren't used to people coming and asking them questions, you know, and anyway. <laughs> So the first thing to do in knowing your heart is really write down what your values are. So what's most important to you? So I hope you all have a piece of paper you can write on your computer or something. You know, write down your values. So it might be family. It might be tradition. It might be discovery. 
um, education, uh, whatever it is, you know, figure out these values. Your heart, where your heart is going to direct you will be within those values. If you're doing something that's like too far away from where your values are, you're not going to be happy. And when you're not happy, you're not creative, you're not, there's a lot you can't do when you're miserable. And so the, the goal is to be in this spot. And it's not just happy, as I want to say, but feeling like your life is really valuable. And then make a list of all the things that when you think of them, uh, make you lift your spirit or give you joy, right? And, and you keep doing that. And you get used to being in a place where the things that you think about are, 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 are uplifting to you, right? So what gives me joy? And ultimately, you'll see where your heart is trying to lead you. And, and knowing your heart is not about where I'm going to be in five years. It's where I'm going to put my foot next. It's, it's one foot after the other, one foot after the other. Okay, so when a student would come to me and say that they felt really lost and can't see which way to go, now often they wouldn't come because that's the time, uh, you know, they might feel they would disappoint me or that they were scared to say what, you know. And the, so when they did come and say that they were just lost, you know, I would say them, say to them that, you know, that's great. <laughs> this is a sign of a, an excellent heart. You know, your heart's not going to let you do anything until you listen to it. So you're just going to be stuck in that place until you quiet down and take the time and, and listen that, that this kind of indecision is really normal and that you should respect and honor that. Um, and it's not a sign that you're going to be a failure. In fact, I think it's a sign that they would have an excellent chance of being a, a great success. But to get past this moment, you be quiet, you go for walks in the mountains, you respect what, what's happening. Uh, sometimes I would imagine just throwing a deck of cards up in the air and letting them, letting them settle. But you, know, you think about your values and you bring you know, positive thoughts into your mind and, and you will begin to um, figure out uh, how to get how to get through that? Um, so, enlisting the things that you love, uh, you know, start with ice cream or whatever. It can be silly things. I'm not silly, you know. Those are really important things, but you know, it will get down to, you know, I love how proteins work or whatever. It'll help you figure out the direction you want to go, and this will be your own path. This isn't anybody else's path. This will be yours. Okay. So, and, and you will have to make decisions sometimes that people don't agree with that your family will be concerned about maybe, but if this is what is in your heart, I really think that it's, it's something that um, you need to go ahead and do. So when I went to UNM, uh, my colleagues from Wisconsin apparently were telling me that, uh, or saying, because I was told, um, that I was throwing my career away. But I went because I love the students. I had to be with these guys. They were just like the most amazing things I'd ever seen. And I heard Spanish and there were Native Americans. <laughs> you know, For me, it was like heaven. Um, and so I had to do it. And then when I closed my lab and really focused on the program and that I was that I was running this pre PhD program, again, you know, you lose stature when you're not doing research and when you're doing mostly mentoring. But you know what, I felt that I couldn't honestly ask anyone else to know and follow their heart. If I wasn't willing to take the risk and make the decision to follow mine. Okay, and I will say that the idea of knowing your heart gets deeper, the longer that you work on it. So principle two, which we always talk about, this is principle two, um, look for the positive or blessing in everything. And this is a um, survival as well as a leadership principle. And looking for the, po for the positive is not Pollyanna, it's not to say that grief and anger have no place or that we should face it, you know, never looking at things that are tough. That's not it at all. It's just that both the good and the bad exist uh, simultaneously. 
And in fact, it's like the yin and yang of Eastern philosophy and Navajo tradition has this, and I'm sure many other tribes um, in traditions include this, but it's possible to actually think about good things that existed around uh, an event or an experience that was negative. So, it, so let's see, right. So I would just say the first thing, first level, okay, level one of principle two, Someone is, is a, you have a macroaggression or someone's racist to you or someone is mean to you or bullying to you, right? You have two immediate positives. One is that you're not that person. And the second one is you're not married to that person. <laughs> and most of my students would laugh. And the laughter was so important because it gives you a moment to realize that that person can't make you do anything, that you get to choose how you're going to respond, right? And so um, you can walk away from that. And if I would always say, you know, if that keeps up and you get that trouble, you come and get your team. But it's very important to know that to have something that lets you stop for a second and, and adjust and, and decide whether or not you even want to engage. On another level, this is really an important leadership principle. Most successful leaders convey a positive vision of where the team or the group is going to go. So I would tell my students, you know, when the proverbial shit hits the fan, that there are two responses. So one of them is, oh, goosh, this is awful. I got to go home, you know. And the other response is, manure, great. I've got the field. Let's go you know, and who is it that you're going to follow, right? You're going to follow the person with the positive vision. And so looking for the positive or the blessing as you really incorporate it into the way that you think, you begin to see uh, ahead that, you know, the group may be facing some big challenge or something may be happening, and you're already looking for ways around, um, to find solutions and to, and to think about where to go. So it's, you know, you're, you're ahead of the game uh, in many ways. So I would say another aspect of this and um, is that we all have large extended families and that sometime, and I know it's happened to, to many of us um, recently that someone who's very, very important to us will die. And I, I would tell my students that as you're driving home and you feel completely hollowed out from grief, that you think why you feel that way. And it's because of the importance of that person in your life. And as you go, think about why that person was so important in your life. You know, think about the experiences you had, the times you've laughed, the big family get togethers, the, you know, going hunting with them or whatever you've done. So that when you get home, you, you feel balanced in a way because, you know, while there's this tremendous grief of losing this person, it's balanced by all the remembering that you have done of the why why that person was so important so that when you get home and the family is in various states of of grief that you can be the one to help everybody sort of move forward and survive the other the final part of this that i love is that um, my students you know i liked students that had challenging childhoods and challenge challenging backgrounds and so uh, I had one student and, uh, and his, his father had died in prison. He'd been in the military and been in war zones and he came back to school and he was working really hard on the GI Bill. And it was the spring before he was applying to medical school and he comes to my door and he looks about half as tall as he is. And I said, what in the world, how are you doing? And he goes, I've ruined my life. I said, really? He said, yes, I got a DUI. Now the spirit just came to me because this wasn't me. I just said, that's the best thing I ever heard. <laughs> he 
he looked at me like I was completely nuts. I said, okay, we're going to sit down and we're going to work because we had the whole summer there and we're going to work. And if at the end of the summer, this DUI is not the best thing that ever happened to you. Yes, you've ruined your life. It's over, but not really. But if in fact, we get to the point where this DUI is the best thing that ever happened to you, it will be the reason you get into every school you apply to. Where did I get that? I have no idea. So anyway, we worked over the summer and uh, it was not easy. He was very stubborn, you know, like many of us are who are first generation, and you know, we've gotten here. It's been a tough slog. And, and, uh, but we finally did, you know, uh, it was that uh, the DUI stopped him and made him wake up. He did not hurt anybody. Uh, he did not hurt himself. Uh, he had children that he was really, that were important in his life and he could, he, he needed to be there for them. You know, his family needed him. He'd put so much into his education on and on and on and on. And he wrote this letter to the medical schools. He got into every school that he applied to. Georgetown wrote me to just say what a great guy he was. And um, uh, anyway, he got so many scholarships, he didn't owe anything when he finished. So it surprises people when you take something that you might see in your life as a failure and turn it into a teacher. Because once you've done that, it's not a failure right? It's a positive. And I had a lot of students who had um, abusive situations in their childhood, or they've been hungry, and we would go back and, and imagine ourselves in that situation, and look around and say, who was there to help you? What did you do? And, and invariably, uh, they would then have a whole narrative about that time that included both sides of the issue so that, you know, if I mentioned it or somebody else mentioned it, they didn't start crying. And so they, they were feeling like dragged back in the past because of this. And they were feeling like less than because of this. And in fact, then they began to see that they were survivors and that they had so much to give to the world because of these experiences that they really did have what I would tell them an unacknowledged PhD in life. Okay, so this is a, this is a principle and it's not a natural thing for many people to, to respond this way, look for the positive or blessing and everything. And so I had an Navajo um, graduate student <laughs> Who, who, that was her job to, you know, she took that on to remind me, you know, okay, Maggie, what's the positive in it, you know, and so uh, we, that's why we need a group that shares these things, because it, it makes it, it makes it easier to uh, make progress. So the third principle is about embracing who you are and bringing it to the table. And this is a group of, of students that were at my house. It's so cute. Oh gosh, I love them. Um, so there are two parts to this uh, and it's about our narratives. So we have two narratives, the story of our ancestors leading to us as the physical presence, right? With all these ancestors. And the second narrative is our story from birth to present, okay? So the, the story about the ancestors is that in every cell in our body, we have DNA from all those people who came before us. And, and so physically, we own all the, the winning and losing, the fighting and loving, the you know, happiness and sadness. That it, this history is in our bodies. And I would tell people that, you know, I have crazy people in my family and they are a blessing because they let me think outside the box and they let me be creative. So when you're going to a table to solve a problem, the last thing we need is a table with a whole bunch of people with uh, different colored skins and different backgrounds and nobody's saying anything. So what you wanna do is wrap yourself in this history like a blanket and get to that table. Because if you are in, depending on what age you are, your voice may be that big. But if you bring all this knowledge and this history and it's there, you know, you will speak with a very deep voice. And in fact, this is so cool for diversity because everybody's got this 
history, this, these ancestors, but but nobody, um, I don't know of, more, of, uh, of the very many people that do this. And so you can actually teach people how to how to honor and respect and love themselves even more in love because because in them is is all this history that we're we're so grateful for these ancestors. Okay. So the second part of embrace who you are and bring it to the table. And, you know, I'm, I'm the only one whose pictures I've got. Well, I guess my kids, I could have done this with, but I'm so old, you know, it's like a lot, it spans a lot. So this is me for all these years. And it's about, it's about your narrative from birth to now. Okay. You lived your childhood, but you weren't watching it. You were in it. And so you won't remember a lot of stuff. And so I, I would really encourage you and I encouraged all my students to go back to their families, to their friends and relatives, anyone who knew you and gather all your stories while you can until you can begin to see yourself as a child becoming an adult. You know, what are the threads that you had no idea about that are part of how you see the world and what you wanna to do today? you know, what were the characteristics? I'm still learning things about myself. It is unbelievable that, you know, I can be this old and still learning things. It's ridiculous. Um, but they will help you understand who you are and the threads that move through your life and your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, so I then started after I realized this, I also spent time asking people I knew and worked with like in DC and elsewhere about their lives. And it's fascinating what you learn about people that you've worked with or known for a long time, um, just asking them about that point. But you can go back in your childhood. That is your unique resource for learning things. That's your teacher, your teacher is in, in that path. And what I loved was watching the moment that um, the students would get that their lives were not only interesting because they didn't think they were those like, I'm sorry, it's a JLo or somebody that's who's really interesting. Like I'm not really interesting. I grew up in Cayenta or something. You know, when they figure out that their stories are fascinating and valuable and that they're theirs. You know? so it was just, it was just great to see that. And people, then it, it was fun. We'd have great conversations after that. And these stories are actually come, come up when letters of intent, you'll use some of that, uh, some of your stories in that. But if we don't do that, and we think that really we're pretty uninteresting or that we may have things in the past that we feel bad about, um, they'll hold us back and they'll keep us all from being the most creative, most innovative visionary leaders that we could possibly be and scientists. It'll hold you back because you're always putting energy into hiding something. And when you can finally then go, you go back and you work with principle two with it. And you can do this with your parents, your friends or whoever. But then it's like, oh, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it works. It works out well. It surprises people and they cannot come back and go, well, you know, you didn't tell us about that thing. No, they're just amazed. People are amazed at the maturity of, of young people who have gone back and looked at these things and understood that, in fact, they learn so much. And because you're here at this meeting, you've, 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 you've made choices, good choices to get you here. But, you know, I always like to work with kids that have little, have had some challenges. I find them very interesting. Um, so, uh, what we found in this, and I'll, I have one more um, principle, but that knowing your heart, looking for the positive or the blessing, embracing who you are and bring it to the table, and the next one show gratitude, that these are massive um, things that we have in common, massive, it's common ground that humans have. 
And I really think this is a good way to move from diversity to inclusion. So if you can have groups and I would, we would talk about this, we'd meet once a week for an hour. And I would, my feeling was I was braiding these ideas into the conversation wherever I could, you know, we would, and, and it took a couple of years of that. It, this isn't something that happens overnight, but um, what I love to see is that my students decades after they've been with me are still talking to each other and still, you know, supporting each other and stuff. So I think it, I think this really works. Okay. So the final one, and this is Roxanne Swensel's, uh, it was an urn that she made for her father-in-law and she's from Santa Clara. And it's to show gratitude or finish well and to acknowledge relationship. So the fourth principle, this is like a, the fourth principle in many traditions from Diné to Hawaiian to the medicine wheel and beyond. It's meant to complete the circle. You know, it makes us look outward again and acknowledge those beings and experiences and spirits who've helped us along the way. And, you know, I have to thank, um, <laughs> I have to thank Willow and I, just everyone here, but Judy, you know, all these people who invited me to give this second talk because it has really opened my eyes um, wider and, and made me think about things that I hadn't thought um, about for a long time. And especially working on this concept that like Greg Cajete says, we are related to the land, but we are the land itself. You know, we are in relationship with all things on earth. And um, I am so grateful for having heard this over and over and, and, you know, sort of come to it. And also the other thing was in putting this together, thinking about the convergence of things, you know, that my life, as much as I think I'm a scientist, has been really guided, uh, you know, I would say by my ancestors, but, you know, whatever you might think that guides you, it's, you know, we think we're in control, but it's been, it's just been an incredible journey. So, I, I did a little this sort of thing when I talked to the students in Wisconsin. You know, I just can't send enough love you, your way. But I just want to say, you know, we have a long way to go. And, and the path really isn't clear. We need our web of family and allies. We need our friends, everybody, you know, and do not give up hope. This is a very hard time, I know. It's a very hard time but do not give up hope. It's not silly to hope. It's not silly to be positive. In fact, positivity uh, can heal you. Positivity can, you know, is, is just, I, I can't say enough about it. Uh, apparently if, if you study aging, you'll know that being a positive person helps you live longer. So that's good, <laughs> but close your eyes, really close your eyes and remember where you come from. It's going to help you see where you're going. And it's not where you're going to be, you know, five, 10 years from now. It's the next step. Honor that next step. Honor the, the short path here right now. You know, it'll help you see where you're going. The smell, taste, feel, and sounds along your journey will be your story. Laughter and love, tears and music will be your story. All the earth, animals, plants, cells, and proteins will be your story. So choose to see your path with different eyes. Trust your heart to know the way. And honestly, I just, you know, trust your path. If you get scared and you think this isn't working, look how far you've gotten. You know, really trust that the next step is gonna be fine. So this is, a, I had a little thing, I just wanted to put it here because I think this will be recorded and you could find it, but this is again, another Roxanne Swensel sculpture. She just, uh, she's my, one of my favorite people on earth. And um, this is, uh, we had a little, let's see, I had these things here. I can't, oh, here. So we had these little cards that you can't do upside down here, this one, this one. And then you'd put them in your wallet and it was this. 
So whenever anybody went for an interview and got scared or something, they would call me and I would go, well, now, is this what you want to do? And okay, let's look for the positive or blessing and, you know, why this is a challenge. Anyways, we go through the whole principles and they're really wonderful because they're a shortcut to very deep conversations. So I want to thank you all and please write me uh, if you have any ideas. I love feedback. I miss talking to students desperately. And I just want to have one more thing in terms of principle four, that I was almost always in a band when I was in school, uh, except for when the kids were growing up. But uh, music made it possible for me to be a scientist. I really, um, you know, it was this what intersecting but not overlapping worlds with of my colleagues. So the music was a place where I could really feel grounded and connected with people. But I wanna thank you very much for, um, for listening to this talk and, and for being here and, and bless us all.